mother of a child. His only parent. Didn't you say that detective friend of yours knocked her up? Or did I hear that wrong? Watch your mouth. Maybe you play your cards right. You'll get lucky too. Oh, unless it's past your time. Freddy. Ooh. See about taking Harry outside for a walk. Of course. She's a pistol. Yeah. Well, maybe I shouldn't have stopped her. Well, it's good you did. <clears throat> she hits harder than you. Detective. We both know our current situation is untenable. Seems like you can keep me here or kill me. What is your plan? You said something about a deal. Let's hear it. too much or too quickly. You'll vomit. And I do apologize, Miss Newsom. But blood is blood, and my sister was determined to have George. She loves him. Love at first sight. It was. And I wouldn't worry. You are so smart and talented. There's sure to be another man for you. You're bad. Don't say that. Oh, well, she's just upset. Anywho, what's done is done, and George and Amelia are now man and wife. <laughs> It was the only thing I could do to save you. And this is what you want? Uh huh. Even though he doesn't love you. Love doesn't always appear, sometimes it grows. You won't get away with this. So help, help me. Effie. Uh, Effie! Stay where you are, George Crabtree. <clears throat> Miss Newsom is in no state to do anything. And I warn you. You have only seen my sunny side. It would be very wise that you mind your manners. What happened? Jack Larkin is dead. I know that. How did that happen? Uh, Mrs. Hart is the investigator. Do you think the son did it? I think so. So now he's a murderer because we couldn't make a case. What about the woman Larkin was with? She's recovering, but says she didn't see anything. So you're going to bring this crazy fellow in? We're looking for him. No look at the address he furnished. Bring the parents in. They'll know. Are you sure? They're already suffering. They're parents. They live in a world of perpetual suffering. At least that's something you'll never have to worry about, Watts. Get on with it. You tell the Falcones you have Anna, you lead them to me, and I won't pursue the matter further. Providing you furnish me with proof that Falcone authorized the murder of Anna Fulford. I can do that. Good. Why are you willing to trust me? No. Oh. Because if you renege, or if any harm comes to Anna or the boy, I'll hunt you down and kill you. <laughs> Please. 
please just have a seat. We don't know where our son is. And our daughter is gone. Can you please just leave us in peace? I just need to talk to Keiji. And I don't know where he is. Why are you doing this to us? If your son is a good man, no harm will come to him. And sometimes even a good man must kill. Do you think he did it? He would not do it. He would not take a man's life. I know my son. Do you have children, Inspector? I do. Two boys. And would you believe them capable of murder? Take a good look. The man's name is Keiji Nakamura, 25 years of age, of Japanese heritage, so he shouldn't be hard to find. If at all possible, bring him in without harming him. I need to question him, not arrest him. Sir. Sir? Poor dear, had a terrible ordeal. Oh, I'm bored. I'm supposed to be on my honeymoon. I want my new life to start. I agree. Really? What's done is done. Perhaps it's time to introduce my new wife to the world. Really, George? Uh, mm, I don't think that's a good idea. I thought you wanted your sister to begin her new life. Please, Dorsey, please. You don't expect her to live in this room with me forever? She comes with us. But that's not necessary. Mm -hmm. It is. And she'll have a gun in her back the entire time. You try even the slightest funny thing, and I'll kill her. Thank you, Dr. Ogden. We're not out of the woods yet, but you've given us a chance. Hello, Beatty. Andrew. This is quite the bloody bother, isn't it? Andrew. This, this is the woman who saved me. She is indeed, bless her. So is he going to come back? That's what I'm counting on. And you trust him? I'm hoping he fears what I'll do to him more than the Falcones. What do you do about him? Return him to his mother. Hopefully grant him a normal life. Are you sure you want to curse him with that? As long as he's safe. What about you? What about me? He's your son. Are you prepared to let him walk out of your life? If it means no harm will come to him, so be it. I'm sorry, William. So am I. suggesting, ladies, is that I've seen your work and you're all as capable as any man. And it's not beyond your capabilities to become doctors. And frankly, the profession would be better served with more women in it. But, Dr. Roger, I'd never be admitted to medical school. She's right. I wouldn't be either. No, well, if with my recommendation, you might. Doctor! Doctor! It's Andrew. Come with me. Good Lord, help him. Nurse, prep for surgery, get a gurney. You two help me with him. It'll be all right. So, Gwen, am I getting my bag back? Sure, ma'am. We'll have your bag here in a moment. I've been waiting. George Crabtree and his harem of women. Quiet, Dorothy. This is so exciting. My new life, a policeman's wife. Who would have thought? <laughs> Dearly beloved. <laughs> you!
George. Oh, it's good to see you, sir. I was afraid some ill had befallen you. Oh, I I'm fine, thank you. But there's something I need you to do for me. That's why I'm here. Is that your son? Indeed. You are a lucky man. Oh, I would hardly say that. Well, the circumstance in which you find yourself is less than fortunate, but the fact you have a son is indeed a good fortune. Yes, George. So, what is it you require of me? You wish me to escort these two to the train station? Oh, uh, no, that will be my responsibility. I need you to do something else. Amelia's behind bars. Why did you marry her? It wasn't real marriage, Effie. It was ordained by Higgins for Pete's sake. And I did it to keep you safe, and you are now. No, I'm not. We'll, we'll find Dorothy. Maybe you should go home and get some rest. George, perhaps you should have married her. In earnest. Then maybe all this would be over. Effie, I don't think you're thinking straight. Suppose I'm not. Uh, Constable Paul, would you escort Miss Newsom home? Maybe stay with her until I get back? Of course. Let me go! George. Let me go! Uh, it's fine. Drink. You'll feel better. It's funny. It's all I did last night. And I don't. You slept in the alley? If that's where you found me. Yes. You know, Mr. Larkin is dead. Dead? Good. But I did not do it. I was drinking all night. Talk to the bartender. Busy bar. With one Japanese man in it. He'll tell you where I was. It wasn't him. He said you didn't get a good look at the assailant. That's true. So perhaps I should say I don't think it was him. What? Well, I only had a glance at the person, but he was much slighter than that man. You sure? No matter what you may think of Jack Larkin, I had a great affection for him. If I thought that was the man who killed him, I would say so. All right, thank you. Detective? Yes, I talked to the owner of the bar. He said the Japanese man was in there until late last night. Was he certain? We had to throw him out. That's probably why he ended up in the alley. I see. Thank you. Oh, uh, could you escort Miss Day home? Of course. City morgue? I don't want to talk to you, George Crabtree. You have to. No, I don't. I hate you. You took my heart and you broke it. I had no choice. How oh, could you leave me on like that? You're certainly not the person I thought you were. Well, nor are you. I should have made you seek help the first time we met. Help? There's nothing wrong with me. Except you. You could have taken what I had to offer. Everything. Where's your sister? How should I know? Amelia, any assistance you can give at this point can only help your cause. <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> she didn't do much to help you, did she? She sacrificed you while she made her getaway. Now, where does she go? Away, away, will Dorothy go? Amelia. Away. Like science? I don't know what I like. I haven't been in school much. It just looks interesting. Wait right here. You don't have to worry. Nobody's following us. How do you know that? I've been watching. I always do. 
My mother told me to always keep my head on a swivel. Well, hopefully you won't have to do that for much longer. For you, young man. Really? Thank you. You'll be going on a long journey. You'll need something to occupy your mind. Thank you. and there was no way to stop it. <laughs> Combine these two chemicals for a great surprise. Uh, but only do that outdoors. I would like it very much if you would come. As would I, but I can't. I have to be certain that you and your mother are safe first. What about after you've done that? There'll be plenty of time to discuss it. I've bought two tickets. I will accompany the boy to New York. Very good. I would be forever grateful if you would see them both safely to England. England? You'll see to the bill? Of course. All right. You best be off. You'll be brave. I'll write you once I do the experiment. I would very much like that. But only once I've told you it's safe to do so. Not before. Okay. I'm glad I met you, Father. As am I, son. As am I. I'm sorry, Detective. I'm no closer to an answer. Have you tried consulting with Dr. Ogden? I doubt that'll be necessary. Uh, I think it is, Mrs. Hart. Lack of knowledge can only be remedied by asking questions. In that way, your job is no different than mine. If you just give me more time. I'm sorry, that's something I don't currently have an excess of. I could request Dr. Ogden myself if you find the matter unpleasant. No. I'll do it. Good. Detective Murdoch. Mr. Falcone. I take it you're enjoying your time in La Belle Provence. Mr. Rhodes told me you had the woman. Give her to me. I don't think so. You didn't hear him. We're here for the woman. Drop your weapon. Take them in, George. A pleasure. This one as well. What do you think you're doing? I'm saving your skin, Mr. Rhodes. Oh, yeah. Making this look good, huh? Yeah, all right, all right. Yeah, it's good, it's good. I see. They're called osteons. Oh, yes, I remember. Both human and animal bones contain them, and in some circumstances, there's easily identifiable osteon banding. In this case, mm -hmm. I'd say almost definitely, this is animal bone. But they said they cremated their daughter. Then they were likely lying. My best guess, this is a pig femur. Thank you, Dr. Ogden. But I do think I should have known that. Well, you don't have as many corpses under your belt as I do. Not yet, anyway. This was rather a pleasant diversion, actually. I lost a patient today. Oh, I'm sorry. There was little that could have been done for him. I tried. It failed. Well, have our questions been answered? 
Doctor? Doctor? Gentlemen, your suspicions are right, Detective. What we're looking at here is an extremely charred pig femur. Huh. Not human at all, then. So the two of them are lying to you. So it would seem. It would also seem their daughter is indeed alive. And now her husband's dead. Bring them in. Pressure them into giving us something useful. And if they don't? Charge them with murder. So the parent should pay for the sin of the child. You better tread carefully, Watts. Mrs. Hart. Ah, Dr. Ogden. George. I was wondering if I might impose on you a moment. Of course. What do you need? I'm hoping you'll have a word with a, a suspect I have in custody. Certainly. Who is it? Until recently, she was my wife. <laughs> well, that may require further explanation. Uh, where shall I begin? <laughs> so tell me, when did it become a crime to take a train to Montreal? When that trip is for the purpose of committing murder. Oh, good luck proving that. I have testimony that posits you commissioned the murder of Anna Fulford. She isn't dead. No, but conspiracy to commit murder is also a crime. And I have a witness that any jury would be compelled to believe. If you go ahead with this, you're signing the death warrant for all those you hold near and dear. I'm not afraid of you. Guard, it isn't me you should be afraid of. The reach of the Black Hand extends far beyond these walls. Good day, Mr. Falcone. You're risking a lot for a bastard son. Julia Ogden. That's funny. What is? A lady doctor. For playing pretend. That I'm Princess Amelia Ernst. Not Mrs. George Crabtree. No, that's not funny. I was supposed to be Mrs. George Crabtree. But he deceived me. But he will love me someday. <laughs> Why do you believe that? When he sees the error of his ways, he will come back to me. And if he doesn't come back to me, then he's in for it. We'll see to that. Will? Mm -hmm. Dorothy and I. Fool us once. Shame on you. What makes you think that George is the one? Because I read his words. <clears throat> He's my soulmate. And we are destined to be together. <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> what do you mean by that? It means... there are more worlds than this one. And I don't care. Which one we are together in. Are you planning on releasing me anytime soon? I will. Not just yet. I'm, uh, kind of a sitting duck in here. Never know who's gonna come walking through those cell doors. Patience, Mr. Rhodes. Patience. No right to disturb my daughter's remains. That is a pig bone, sir. You did not cremate your daughter. In fact, I believe she's very much alive. That's not true. I'm afraid it is. A scientific test has proven that bone to be animal in nature and 
as the inspector said, most likely a pig. What was the nature of your ruse? Our daughter is dead, and that man killed her, and the woman before her. He is the guilty man. Did you know about this? So, is this how you want to play? Right then. All three of you are charged with the murder of Mr. Jack Larkin. Uh, you had all better think carefully about what you are doing. I would like to make a formal statement saying that Station House 4 have entered formal charges against Mr. Hakuri and Mrs. Yua Nakamura in the murder of Mr. Jack Larkin. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. What are you doing? I'm letting the press know that we've done our job. Formally. Amelia's not well, George. She should be in prison for kidnapping. I'd like to see her committed. It's possible her condition is treatable. And if it's not? Then the asylum is where she'd reside. I suppose I should have a charitable mind about it. She does have excellent taste in men. How's Miss Newsom? She's a bit shaken up by the whole ordeal. I can imagine. Should I reach out to her? I shouldn't think so. Effie's made of stern stuff. A good night's sleep, she'll be fine. Uh, have you spoken to the detective? Yes. He found Harry. Oh, that's good news. So he'll be coming home soon. Yes, I suppose. Where are you on? I'm on whatever your time. I have nothing to say to you. I have a lawyer coming. Oh? You may want to hold off on that. And why is that? Because I'm about to make you an offer you had best not refuse. Miss Fulford is granted her freedom, then I will have no reason to pursue any matter against you or any other member of the Black Hand. Except Mr. Falcone. Except Mr. Falcone. He will be put away for a long time. Okay. Then the woman can live. You can give me this assurance. The matter of Anna Fulford is only of concern to the Falcone family. The rest of the organization <laughs> would rather not be involved in chasing some silly woman who did nothing wrong. You can assure me that his grievance isn't shared by any other member of the Black Hand? If Falcone is out of the picture, we will wash our hands of the whole affair. You have my word. And what's that worth? As much as yours. Wish your son a long and happy life. No sign of her, George. I imagine she's far away from here if she knows what's good for her. Right, Higgins, look at this. What is it? Windsor newspaper archives. Here's a story about a house fire. An entire family was killed. It sounds like a shame. There were two survivors, a couple of children that the family took in. Uh huh. Twin girls. And they murdered the family? Well, I don't know. I suppose it could have been an accident, but it says here there were rumblings at the time, something funny about the fire. 
Well, there's nothing funny about a fire, George. And I speak from experience. Ruthie almost burned our house down a few nights ago. How? Warming milk. Good Lord. Don't you have a nanny or some such? She quit. And you didn't hire another? She quit, too. Uh, Ruthie can be quite demanding. Little Jordan can be quite a handful as well. Jordan? I don't know where you came up with that name. Came to Ruthie in a dream. So, are you still going to ask Miss Newsom to marry you? I don't know, Wiggins. Now hardly seems like the right time. I think that as long as those two are out there, there's never going to be a right time. Join your grape juice? You know they didn't do it, don't you? I don't care. Then let them go. No, they're up to something. If they wanted to kill Mr. Larkin, they had ample opportunity. And so did the daughter. And up until recently, she's had the perfect alibi. Death. So, what does arresting them accomplish? If she's a good person, she'll come forward. The whole of Toronto considers her parents to be murderers. Let's see if she can live with that. And if she can? I'll let them go. Right now, I'm just fishing. You're troubled, aren't you? You're very perceptive. You want to talk about it? Just like... leave it, Wax, all right? Oh, of course. About time. You aren't going anywhere. We had a deal. Had. But I've made another deal with the Black Hand. A better deal. I'll recant everything I told you. Every bit of information I gave you. You go ahead. I have others who will swear that you and Falcone acted alone. Acted alone about what? You murdered an innocent woman and put her body in a barrel of lye and who knows how many countless others you did the same to. We had a deal! You were going to kill my son. You're a dead man. We all are eventually, Mr. Rhodes. Get some sleep. I hear it's good for you. I would like to see my parents released. We'll decide that once we hear what you have to say. I killed my husband, a Mr. Jack Larkin, and I acted alone. You hardly did that. Your parents helped you fake your death. That was only to escape him. Well, your family did more than that. They accused him of murder. He is a murderer. He killed his first wife. How do you know that? He told me on more than one occasion. And you never went to the police? He would have killed me, so I needed to escape him. And you had escaped him, and yet you went back to kill him. Why? He beat me almost every day. And I let him. I thought once he was arrested, it would be over, and no woman would ever have to suffer him. But then I saw him free. And with another woman, I couldn't have that on my conscience. You should have come to the police. You had him. And you did nothing. 
Please, let my family go. They did nothing wrong except try and save me. What happens now? We recommend leniency. A Japanese woman kills a well-respected white man? What sort of leniency will be granted? Hopefully enough to save her from the noose. I am in your debt, George. Oh, it was pleasure enough to be of assistance. I've told your superior that you are a most able officer. Thank you, but that was hardly necessary. You are destined for greater things. I am French, sir. The position I hold is as far as I will ever advance. The Montreal police is not favorably inclined towards its French officers. Mm, of course. I've faced something similar in Toronto. The constabulary does not look favorably upon Catholics. Mm. What would a Neptunian make of us? A Neptunian? <laughs> a being from another planet. What would they think about how we on Earth are dividing ourselves? Especially since we are essentially all the same. But I wonder what Neptunians think of Venusians. Not much, I would think. They are a bad bunch. <laughs> would you mind if I accompanied you to the train? I would appreciate that. <laughs> Have you given much thought to other species inhabiting this Earth? Like, uh, mermen? <laughs> oh, I think mole men are far more probable. I feel that as well. If you're ever in Toronto, there's someone you should meet. For the journey home. Oh, come say ball. I have converted you. We'll see. <laughs> Your son's in Winnipeg. We have friends there. Reliable friends. Is he safe? As far as we know. The rest of your payment. We haven't brought him back yet. I don't want you to. His life is his own now. What he does with it, that's up to him. I appreciate this. Do you understand what I'm saying? Stay out of trouble. Sometimes you don't know how your day is going to turn, do you? I didn't expect it to come too much, but today was a very good day. I do feel like I'm starting to fit in with the people I work with. Julia Ogden helped me with a case today. Perhaps I'm not infallible, but she seems not a bad soul at all. Maybe she just needed a second chance. Which got me thinking. We all need a second chance sometimes, don't we? Would you like one? Thank you. This is our second chance. How do you feel? Grateful. I feel grateful. Good. Shh, 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 shh. 
There's nothing there. Are you sure? I'm sure. Dearest Anna, I do hope you are settling into what will be a normal life. I think the threat to you has passed, and you may be able to live in peace. If there is occasion, I would dearly love to see Harry again. Yours, William. If you would rather I not send it, I won't. Of course not, William. It's clear that you share something. And he's your son. He should be a part of your life. Our life? Yes, our life. Although I'm not sure how I tolerate two of you. <laughs> you could. He has a keen interest in science. Not much of a surprise. It's not something I ever thought I would need. I've always known that about you, William. And I'm glad you have it. Thank you. I'm going to get ready for bed. I'll join you. I should hope so. What's this one? Does it matter? Oh, I'm just curious. Thief. A stupid fat thief. Anyone care to say a prayer? <laughs> we'll leave them to you. Let's get a drink. <laughs> Better than words, buddy. For the journey ahead. See, it's quite small. I could carry it in my pocket. And I have no doubt you will. And it's surprisingly powerful. I've tested it. Let me see. <laughs> William. What should I look at? Um, today's headline. No. Really? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes, I get... Oh, my goodness. What is it? Escaped. I thought he would have been released by now. I would have thought so as well, sir. Why would he escape now after so many years? Especially someone like Giles. Never been a more straight-laced bugger than him. Well, he did bury a body in a police station, sir. Oh, yeah. There was that. Uh... Sir, with your permission, I'd like to take the day to look into this. You're going to Kingston? If I catch the 9, 10 a.m. out of Union, I can be back by nightfall. Carry on. time. 
time do you have left to serve? Three months. If I last. We'll do our best to ensure you're properly treated, Mr. Giles. In fact, we'll see if we can do even better than that. Thank you. surgery for what my husband believes i may have damaged my womanly parts your reproductive organs we've been trying for months but you haven't conceived he's in medical school and he's heard that vigorous activity can lead to permanent damage what kind of activity i've been playing a game with my friends we call it mintonette though some call it volleyball have you heard of it no it's like badminton only you use your hands in a ball Oh, well, then I suspect your womanly parts are just fine. Do you menstruate regularly? Every month, yes, like clockwork. Well, the problem could be your husband's sperm count. Has he ever been tested? No, he doesn't believe in onanism. I see. And yet he would consider subjecting you to unnecessary surgery. He picked the lock to the morgue, pried open the casket, and pulled the lid down by means of an improvised ratchet. Giles was said to be released last year. What happened? There was an incident with a fellow inmate. One of the Clan Nguyen? No, a condemned man by the name of Jimmy Mortimer attacked Mr. Giles in the common. Jimmy Mortimer? Killed a young woman a few years back. Ah, oh, yes, and then escaped on his way to prison. She was recaptured last year. When he set eyes on Giles, he attacked him. They fought. And for this, Giles received more time on his sentence. He attempted to strangle the young man, detective. He was lucky to get three years. Still, it was disheartening. He'd been a model prisoner to that point. No! No bird dogs sniffing one another's hind ends. I want people out there with bloodhounds. A pack of them, with their noses to the ground. I want them to trace his every move. Detective Samuel, this is Detective Murdoch. How do you charmed? We have a credible sighting here, four miles west of Pitts Ferry. You think he's gone downriver? Of course he's gone downriver. He's heading to America. It's just a question of where he's crossing. That's assuming Giles is indeed seeking his freedom. Well, I don't think he executed this brazen escape to go fishing, Detective Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. And your interest in this is? The same as yours. I wish to find Mr. Giles. Have at it. Do you have horses? Two in the stables. I'm commandeering them. Do you have an office with a telephone? Well, you can use the one down the hall. So, Detective, how can I assist you? I was hoping to see Mr. Giles' correspondence over the past year. I'll have it brought to my office. Anything else? I'd like to speak with Jimmy Mortimer. I'll arrange that. Sure, I attacked him. Not many of us get the chance to punch out the bastard who put us here. You blame him for your conviction? He planted my knife where they found her body. Chief Constable Giles. So we're talking about in that? I'd have killed him if I could have. Instead, he got the better of you. Bastard's tougher than he looks. He grabbed my leg as I was kicking him. Next, I knew I was on the ground in a chokehold. You want to know what's funny? You want to know what mattered most? See you squeezing the life out of me? You want to know how I escaped? Can you believe that? Seven years inside, and he's still a copper first. You're closing your practice? I don't feel I can represent my clients in my current state. What's wrong? I just feel this... this overwhelming anxiety. Some days I can't even leave my house. What does George say? He always says the right thing, but... I fear he'll soon start to pity me, and I can't bear that. I know you practiced in this field, and I thought you might help me snap out of it. I have studied this, Effie, but more importantly, I've, I've been through it myself. You have? Years ago, I thought that I would bounce back, but there were days I couldn't get out of bed. William was despairing. That's exactly how I feel. It was always so strong. Now I feel as if a hole's opened up beneath me. You were kidnapped and left to die. 
It's left a very deep impression. I'm afraid there's no snapping out of it. Well, you seem fine now. It took time and effort. You need to fight the urge to shrink away from the world. What on earth kind of game is that? Oh, I think they call it volleyball. Isn't that Louise Cherry? <laughs> it's a ball, not a bullet. You're supposed to knock it back, not duck. It's fine. Leave. You were just taking up space anyway. Really? Is that how you plan on winning games? What? It appears your teammates have abandoned you. They were useless. Perhaps we should give it a try. We? Another thing that can help is vigorous exercise. Have you ever played before? I'm sure it can't be that hard to pick up. <laughs> How do we do it? Stand there. Is this everything? We don't keep a record of any outgoing correspondence. There isn't much here. He didn't have many friends. Well, he once did. He used to move in fairly high circles. Now he's a homosexual who buried a body. Do we know who Jay is? I'm afraid there's no return address on that one. What does it say? Nothing of note, just uh, an account of the recent weather. Take as much time as you need. Detective. A rowboat has been reported stolen from a boathouse just west of Howe Island. You think he's rowing across? Not the whole river. He would be too exposed. I expect he's rowing across the strait. He's going to leg it over Wolf Island, and he's going to swim the rest of the way. You've notified the American authorities? They have mounted patrols from Clayton to St. Vincent. They have two steamboats on either side of Carlton Island. They're going to give him a nice, warm welcome. Unless it's a ruse. A ruse. I suspect you'll find a scuttled rowboat nearby. I believe he's staying in Canada. Oh, that's right. You don't believe she's seeking his freedom. You follow that theory, I'm gonna follow where he actually went. As you know, an escaped felon can be shot on sight. He gets one warning and then it's bullets. Stay out of my way. Detective, you wanted to tell me something. Just that my inquiry here is complete. You were right to keep it to yourself. I know that bugger. Detective Samuel. He was at Station House One in the early 90s. He was as relentless as Giles, but more ruthless. Giles' best hope is that you find him first. Good to know. Well, this is Tate Street. How do you know it's Tate Street, Toronto? There must be Tate Streets everywhere, man. Just following my instincts. The note did specify a coal bin. Huh. Why do I ever doubt you, Meadow? It's empty. Giles must have got here first. That was my only clue. Who sent the letter? Someone who signed off with the initial J. Think, Murdoch. Who would stay loyal to Giles? Who would he trust after all these years? Hodge. John Hodge. Tom, William. I'm just closing up, I'm afraid. We're not here for a drink, me old mucker. Tell us about 14 Tate Street. We know it was you who wrote the letter, Hodge. What was in the coal bin? Just a pair of dungarees and money. That was it, I swear. I haven't seen or talked to him. Where's the letter? I burned it. You're a terrible liar, Hodge. You always were. Hodge, the man that's after Giles, 
We'll kill him if we don't find him first. Where is the lighter? The Bedford Park Hotel. That's up on Young Street. If you hear from him, let us know. Bed hasn't been slept in. Maybe you got scared off. Sir, would you trust your life to John Hodge's ability to keep a secret? Huh. Not bloody likely. It would be an excellent way to find out who is following you. Do you think he's watching us? Sir, please turn off the lights. in a hurry. Murdoch, look at these. Feed from a telephone directory. He was looking for someone then. That's an evidence log from our city morgue. A morgue? What's he bloody after? Mrs. Hart. Oh, detective, what can I do for you? A man I'm seeking broke into your morgue last night. I saw no indication of that. He likely picked the lock and stole this from one of your files. I need to know which file. A knife wound to the heart. You don't see too many of those. Hmm. There's no date, so it may go back a ways. Hmm. I'll take a look. It shouldn't be too long. Thank you. Murdoch, they're putting these up all around town. They know he's in Toronto. Better keep his head down. Henry, I need your assistance. Look up every name on this page. Who they are, where they work, pull any files we may have on them, but do not contact them directly. Certainly, sir. There are just a couple of things I need to take care of first. What am I looking for? Any connection they may have to former Chief Inspector Giles, however tangential. Sir. Ah, oh, Mrs. Hart. Mrs. Hart, what have you? It was from this file here. Pearl Wallace. Pearl Wallace. Wasn't she the young girl that was murdered a few years back? Some street thug did it. Jimmy Mortimer. Was anything else missing from this file? I looked up the list. The only other thing that was missing was a sketch of the murder weapon taken from the wound impression. Thank you. Why is Giles looking into the murder of Pearl Wallace? Sir, Jimmy Mortimer is the man who was convicted of the crime. He had an altercation with Giles a little over a year ago in prison, which is why Giles' sentence was extended. Coincidence? Not bloody likely. Giles used to pal around with the girl's father, Fenton Wallace. Well, well, well. Gerard Samuel. Detective Samuel, you've come to Toronto. We found a rowboat scuttled offshore, as you suspected. Clearly, you wanted us to think he crossed over to the American side. He probably scuttled the boat knowing that you'd find it, thinking he was still on this side, when in fact he swam across. Yeah, that's very clever. Giles is nothing if not clever, but we've had reports of sightings this morning. Where? One at the docks, a man in a gray sack suit, and one at Castle Frank, a man in dungarees. Both match the description. Charles has been seen in Toronto. He made contact with a man named John Hodge. It's very clever. Bedford Park Hotel. He had cleared out by the time we got there, but perhaps you'll find something we missed. 
That's very good, detective. Keep me apprised of anything else you find out. That'll keep them occupied. So, you're heading to Castle Frank. Well, sir, we aren't going to find Giles by looking where he's been. We have to predict where he's going to be. I'm going to have a word with Fenton Wallace. Carry on, madam. Percy Giles. <laughs> Haven't heard that name in years. He's made no attempt to contact you? Oh, heavens no. We were friends once, but he turned into a rather unsavory character, as you know. Hmm. So you have no idea why he may be looking into your daughter's murder? Pearl, what could she have to do with this? I'm afraid I don't know. Perhaps it's connected to the man who was convicted of the murder? Jimmy. You know him by his Christian name? He used to work for us. Worst mistake of my life. He became obsessed with Pearl. Sadly, she toyed with him. Let him believe his affections were reciprocated. As if he was worthy of her. She just wanted to make Whitney jealous. Whitney? Jacobson? Her fiancé. Yes, fine lad. Good family. Jimmy Mortimer killed my daughter, Pearl. And killed her mother, too, as far as I'm concerned. Mother had consumption. She went downhill quickly when Pearl died. The only time I want to hear that name again is when they announce his hanging. Until then, if it's all the same, detective, I really don't want to talk about this anymore. Sir, I went through all the names as you requested. There were quite a few, as you know. Did you find anything? Well, sir, I noticed one was listed as a police guard, so I called all the agencies, and he's not currently employed. But seven years ago, he worked for Regency Guard Services. They provide guards for prison transfers and such. Is there an end to this story, Higgins? Well, sir, he was the guard in charge when Jimmy Mortimer escaped. Is that name again? Alan Sutton, sir. Clarence Avenue. In his altercation with Mortimer, Giles kept asking about that escape. Charles was seen here. Alan Sudden lives here. He's making his way through the ravine. Of course, he'd have to. Right. Charles was last seen in Castle Frank an hour ago. Well, you'd better get cracking then, Murdoch. Julia, I was just on my way out. We are here to see the inspector, actually. Oh. Well, then, I'll see you at dinner. <laughs> I don't know why this is necessary. It's necessary for our collective sanity, Miss Cherry. Inspector. What can I do for you, ladies? We've decided to form a team to play volleyball. It's a new game. There's a ball, there's a net. They want a coach. Are you up for it? I'm not too familiar with the, uh... Inspector, we need you. We would never have won the roller races if it weren't for your support. That is true. <laughs> Hello, I'm Detective William Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. I'm looking for an Alan Sudden. You and everybody else, you're seven years too late. Um, Have you seen this man by chance? Yeah. He's in my kitchen. I beg of you, Murdoch, let me finish what I started. Jimmy Mortimer escaped while his guard was supposedly inspecting a broken axle. Supposedly. The guard was paid off. According to his wife, he came home with $1,000. $1,000? In crisp $4 bills from the Toronto bank. But who could have paid such a fortune? No one in his family? Friends? I intended to lead an investigation into the matter. Why didn't you? You've arrested me. After that, I forgot all about it. 
until he attacked you. He accused me of planting his knife at the scene. I hadn't, of course, but it was the one bit of evidence of which I was unsure. And for this, you broke out of jail. If Mr. Mortimer's innocent and hangs for a crime he didn't commit, it would be entirely my fault. You felt you had been biased. I disliked the lad detective. I wanted to convict him, and I was blinded to the possibility of evidence to the contrary. Why break out of prison? Why not simply ask me to help you? <sighs> On what evidence? All I have is an unease, as deep as my bones, that a terrible injustice is about to unfold. Oh, I suppose I am asking you now. How much time do we have? Three days until he hangs. Right. I'll help you. Thank you, Detective. Ma'am? Hello? Sorry to trouble you, ma'am. We are trying to locate an escaped felon. Have you perchance seen this man? We have reason to believe that he may have come through this way. It took you. They went out back. They? The man you're after and the man who's after him. Downstream, wait for me at the river. Oh, for crying out loud, do you not know where your hands it's end? Cherry, it's just a game. Hide and seek is a game. This is a competition. To be honest, I don't know where my hand's at. Ladies, ladies. Ball, please, Miss Cherry. Right then, ladies. I think I've got a handle on this. Basically, it's just tennis with a big fat ball and no racket. What we need is a man up front by the net. Taller the better. That would be you, Miss Newsom. Right. Just knock down anything that comes over. At the back, we need a powerful server. Someone who can serve the ball as far into their side as possible. That would be you, Miss Cherry. Dr. Ogden, just float around. All right, then, ladies, let's play ball. Brilliant. William, I'm so glad you're home. I have discovered the most wonderful game. Julia, there's something I need to tell you. Mr. Giles. This is what you retrieved from the morgue? It's a sketch Dr. Grace made of what she deduced was the murder weapon based on the wound. It appears to show the tip missing. Yes, I can see that. It's possible that the tip broke off the blade when the knife hit the sternum. Dr. Grace never found it. Well, that will be the inspector. If the tip dislodged in a chamber, it could have been swept into the aorta and traveled quite a distance in the heart's final beats. In which case, it should still be in her body. Yes, but I wouldn't rely on the sketch of a wound impression. Unless the putative weapon were missing a tip, it's simply not convincing. Excuse me. Courtesy of Station House 3. Thank you, Inspector. Any word on Detective Samuel's investigation? Funnily enough, he asked the same about you. Ah, oh, so he's off the trail then. Perhaps, but he won't be off it for long. Here we are. Mortimer's knife. With his finger marks, and as you can see, the tip is very much intact. And what is this? Oh, that would be Pearl's diary. It was found in her purse. The last page has been removed. 
Presumably by the killer. I assume you've looked through it for any possible clues? Of course, but it was mostly the kind of romantic nonsense one expects these days from young women. <sighs> my bounty is as boundless as the sea. My love is deep. The more I give to thee. That's from Romeo and Juliet. Precisely my point. She was about to marry, so I suppose it's to be expected. And I assume they've included the witness statements? Yes, family mostly. Mr. Mortimer was clearly obsessed with a woman who was in love with another man. Well, there's your motivation, then. As obvious as it was lacking for everyone else. You think he was innocent? I honestly don't know what to think, Inspector. Hold it. Who was she in love with? Her fiancé, of course. Whitney Jacobson. Well, he's not Romeo. She calls Whitney the Prince of Cats. Tybalt, Romeo's rival and the man she did not want. How did you miss that? Uh, I'm uh, afraid my tastes are modern. I'm not so well versed in the classics. So who's Romeo then? Well, the man she's not permitted to marry, of course. Jimmy Mortimer. All along it was in front of me and I didn't see it. If I was looking for motivation, I'd be looking at the fiancé. Jealousy? Yeah, yes, of course. We need to talk to Whitney Jacobson. He's not back in town until tomorrow. Then in light of this new evidence, I say we make use of the darkness and pay a visit to the scene of the crime. Murdoch, you should arm yourself. You bring in a fugitive in, remember? I don't think he's likely to run, sir. Not for Giles. For sure. Doctor? Please be careful. This is where she was killed. Why kill her at her family's gravesite? Well, it was assumed that the murder was a punishment for the entire family for keeping her away from him. It's a reasonable motive when Jimmy Mortimer was the suspect, but why would Whitney want to punish the entire family? I have absolutely no idea. It's a very good question. Where was the murder weapon found? In the bushes over there. That's an odd place to hide a murder weapon with your finger marks on it. Yes, I thought so too. That's why I had doubts. Jimmy Mortimer was no intellectual, but he certainly had a street boy's cunning. Put your hands in the air. Oh, no. Do as he says, Mr. Giles. No. Giles! Is lower and that would have gone through my head. I told you to stay out of my way. I'll tell you what, detective, I will buy you a brand new hat if you can explain to me how an officer of the law was abetting a fugitive from justice. Abetting? You were hot on his trail at Sutton's house. Ten hours later, I find you chatting like old pals. I'm intent on bringing Mr. Giles back to prison. And how are you proposing to do that? With just your good looks and your sweet talk? Homburg, is it? Mr. Giles was intent on proving a condemned man innocent. That's why he escaped from prison. He's trying to save a man's life and prevent a tragic miscarriage of justice. I don't care. It's a close call, sir. A little too close for my liking. I'd hazard a guess and say nicked a few hairs. <laughs> What's the word on Giles? Well, sir, they're searching Ashbridge's Bay and the harbor, but so far no body has turned up. So what's next, then? I have Whitney Jacobson coming in for an interview, sir. I'll pop to Toronto Bank, see if they have a record of a cash withdrawal for, what was it, $1,000? On or about July 7th, 1902. And if it came from Jacobson's account, we've got him. 
Mr. Jacobson, please have a seat. So, I understand Percival Giles is on the loose. Any luck in locating him? Mr. Giles is still at large. So how can I help you, Detective? I have some questions pertaining to the murder of your former fiance. Pearl. Percival Giles escaped prison because he believes Jimmy Mortimer is innocent of the crime. Really? Well, I'll help any way I can. Were you aware that she was infatuated with Jimmy Mortimer? I know that he was infatuated with her. We have reason to believe it was mutual. Which gives you motive. To kill Pearl. Where were you the night of her murder? <laughs> Some kind of wedding business. I don't remember. It has been seven years. You don't remember? Pardon me a moment, Mr. Jacobson. This is a record of a thousand dollar cash withdrawal from the bank of Toronto the day before Jimmy Mortimer escaped. The exact amount given to Alan Sutton? Yes, but it wasn't drawn from Jacobson's account. Where from? It came from the general expense account of the household of Fenton Wallace. That's preposterous. The bank has made some sort of mistake. 1902, is it? What day? July 2nd. Uh, July the 2nd. I don't understand. Who beside you had access to this account? Well, Roddy, of course. Father's accountant. Who else? My wife, the house manager, the cook. Why, why would someone from this house want to free the man who murdered my sister? Perhaps they believed him to be innocent. Oh, never. Do you believe him to be innocent? I believe it's possible. Why? What do you know that we don't? Pearl was not in love with Whitney Jacobson. She was in love with Jimmy Mortimer. She called him her Romeo. She was infatuated, that is all. So you knew? He was the one infatuated with her. She was of the gentry. He was a common street rat. It was impossible. She knew it. She went to tell him, and that is why he killed her. They found his bloodied knife in the shrubbery nearby. It had his finger marks. The knife was planted. Good God! One of you went up to his room, found his knife, took it away, and planted it at the murder scene. Someone call the police. All in due time, Fenton. I've made an arrangement with Detective Murdoch that I will return to prison at the conclusion of this investigation. The truth is, Jimmy killed my sister. There is no one else that it could have been. Unless she was intending to run away with him, which would have been a disgrace to your family's reputation. Are you suggesting no, that- Enough. I won't hear of this. Jimmy Mortimer killed my daughter. And as for all your scurrilous fantasies, you do not have a shred of proof he did not. Have you? This inquiry has concluded, Percy. Time for you to return to prison where you belong. But not quite, Mr. Wallace. We may not have proof this very moment, but I believe I know where we can get it. I don't, I don't understand what tip, what knife. We believe the tip of the knife that killed your sister may have broken off in her body. If it's in there, that means that Jimmy's knife could not have been the murder weapon. Well, there we have it. That's proof. Have you found it then? I... I was so sure. Mr. Wallace, did you plant Jimmy's knife at the murder scene? It, it was him. I had to do something. He killed her. There's something else here under the body. What is it? There's the murder weapon. My mother, she must, she must have put it there. There's something else. It 
What's the missing page of her diary? Oh, happy dagger, this is thy sheath. That's from Juliet's death scene. That's what she says just before she stabs herself in the heart. So Pearl killed herself then? She was in love with a man she couldn't have. And suddenly it all makes perfect sense. It was her mother who discovered the body. Let her daughter murdered than suffer the shame of suicide. Oh, no. It's Detective Samuel and his men. They'll be here any minute. That's excellent timing, Detective. I need to surrender myself to your custody. They'll add years to your sentence. Such is the price I must pay for the truth. The truth at all costs, eh? Indeed. Escaping from police custody is a serious offense. And as you're no doubt aware, there may well be consequences. I had to see Ava again. To make amends somehow. Bring her in with dignity. To get at the truth. The truth at all costs. But you and I are not arbiters of justice. We are merely servants of the law. It is no simple task to remain incorruptible, especially in defiance of one's own conscience. Cold comfort, eh, Inspector? You are no longer a servant to the law. What are you saying? <clears throat> Take this knife, point it at me. That's the coal train leaving the port. It will be coming up the valley in three minutes. Take my weapon, drop the knife, and you can be free. The choice is yours, Mr. Giles. Bloody hell. Everyone stand back! Was spotted in Buffalo. Perhaps he scuttled another boat. <laughs> Detective Samuel, I see your quarry has escaped. It's in the Americans' hands now, regrettably. Although maybe you have no regrets. I regret he took my sidearm. Well, I can't prove that you let him go. Bloody right, you can't. So I guess it was a deal. Sure, it's not broken? <sighs> yes, but it may be bruised for another few days. I'm yeah. so sorry. Don't be. It's fun. Besides, Miss Cherry's right. It's more fun to win. Oh dear. Just keep your hands up in front of your face, Miss Dewsom. <laughs> so, we have a new member of the team joining us today, ladies. Oh, Mrs. Hart, welcome mm -hmm. to the team. That's a coat I can't afford. Have you played before? I've had the rudiments explained. Hmm. Right then, ladies, here's the plan. It's not enough to bat the ball back and forth until someone fluffs it. We need to work the ball to the front of the net, get it up high, and then hammer it. Hammer it? Yes. Hammer it down, like driving a spike in. They won't know what's hit them. Inspector? Oh, of course. Right, ladies? Let's volleyball! All Sir, parcel for you from Winnipeg. Bring it up again. But you will. 
It's just if we all practice more, like I said, we would have won. That Rochester team played like a finely tuned machine. We all have busy lives, Miss Cherry. Yes, but one can always make time. What about the at-home exercises, the finger press, the arm lifts? Volleyball is not cutthroat competition. Thought you wanted to win. I do, but it's also supposed to be fun. You know what's fun? Winning is fun. What about you? Did you do the exercises? No, I'm afraid I didn't do any. You at the time, you're not working right now. <laughs> you did wonderfully. Wonderful job of letting the ball hit the ground. Miss Cherry, that is quite enough. Now then, ladies, what's all this? Someone on the team doesn't believe in losing graciously. I assume, Miss Cherry, that that someone is you. If wanting to win is a crime, then yes. Guilty as charged. I thought this was supposed to be relaxing. Well, it would be. Miss Cherry, I think you've said your piece. When we're back in Toronto, we can talk about scheduling practices. But in the meantime, who would like a cup of tea? I would love one. Ah. Ladies? Take no notice of Miss Cherry. I thought you did a cracking job out there. Thank you, Inspector, but I know that I need a great deal more practice. I'm absolutely terrible, aren't I? The worst I've seen. <laughs> oh. Where's the porter? This train is going awfully fast. Oh, it's an express. No. No, something's wrong. What the bloody hell's going on? The train is gonna crash! Everyone brace yourselves! The train crashed. Are you all right? I believe so. A little bruised, but I'm okay. How are you? Fine. My wrist. I landed on it. Let me take a look. You're lucky. It's just sprained. You'll still be able to write. Just sprained? This is my serving arm. Just keep it elevated and still. What are you doing? Making a sling. Hurry up, then. Would you prefer a gag? Are you all right? Is everyone all right? Oh, dear. You've hit your head. Mrs. Hart. This man has a nasty gash on his head. He'll need stitches. You'll find everything you need in my bag. But I'm not a doctor. You've stitched a corpse. Same principles. Except these ones move. So be very careful. Miss Lucy. Miss Lucy. Effie. Effie. Is everyone all right in here? Everyone seems fine, but Miss Lucy's trapped. Effie, can you hear me? Uh huh. Okay. Don't move. Your legs are trapped. We need to get this off her. Excuse me, are you the porter? Yes, sir. Cliff Adams. Mr. Adams, give us a hand with this, sir. Sir, if you could give us a hand with this, please. One, two, three. Ah! <laughs> Effie, try not to move at all. Mr. Adams, can you go and get my medical bag? Ask for Mrs. Hart. She should have it. Yes, ma'am. Inspector, can you gather some napkins? And we need water. What happened? Just stay very still, Effie. Here. Oh, thank you. That cut on your brow. It won't need stitches, but I can see that you're favoring your side. Uh, I'm fine, I'm fine. Did you hit it when you went down? Caught it on the edge of the bar. Wouldn't be the first time. Do you think I've bruised my side? 
Well, I need to take care of Effie, but then I want to look at that bruise. It can wait. Look, I'm gonna have a look in the engine car, see what happened. If anybody's injured, I'll come and find you. Oh, thank you. Effie. Effie, I'm going to give you some laudanum. It will help with the pain. Inspector Brackenry, Toronto Constabulary. Can you tell me what happened? Damned if I know. I went to slow the train coming into that curve, but the brakes didn't react. The brakes failed? Exactly. Were you alone in the engine car? Yes. A fireman should have been with me, but... Uh, there he is. Pinsky! Where the hell were you? I was in the privy. The privy? Tell me more about the brakes. Well, I had a look. And the only way I figure it is at least one of the angle cocks on the brake valve was turned off. How does that happen? Somebody turns them off. Are you saying that someone did this deliberately? It looks that way to me. Henry? Oh, sir, I wasn't expecting you here on a Sunday. Oh, yes. I'm here to work on my ground-controlled aerial surveillance camera. Uh, have you brought your daughter to work? I had to, sir. Ruth is celebrating a new holiday called Mother's Day. Apparently, it's all the rage in America. A day solely to celebrate mothers. Lovely idea. It's not just that. According to Ruth, it's a day where mothers can do whatever they please. Without their children. Uh, yes, she has quite the busy day with her friends planned, doing whatever it is they do. And Sunday is the nanny's day off, so... I see. Yes. Well, that's enough of that. Oh, come on. Here we go. Yep, here we go. But, sir, I assure you, I'm just on desk duty today, so it's going to be fine. You won't even know we're here. <laughs> Newstand robbery at King and Portland. We have to go. There's no one else? <sighs> well, how would you like to take a little walk, then, hmm? Uh, Henry, you can't bring a baby to a crime scene. Well, it's a newsstand robbery, sir. <laughs> Nevertheless. Uh, of course. Uh, Detective Watts, perhaps you could watch Jordan just for a little while? I'm sorry, I have plans. I'm only here waiting for a friend. Well, it can't be too dangerous. The robbery has already happened. <laughs> oh, Henry, I'll watch baby Jordan. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> I promise she'll probably sleep the whole time I'm gone. You, you won't even notice she's here. <laughs> How is she? I've given her some laudanum. It should help with the pain and get her to rest. Is her leg badly damaged? No lacerations, but possibly a fractured tibia. Her pulse is strong, though. She looks so pale. Yes. I can't treat her properly until we get to a hospital. Can we send a party ahead to the train station to get help? They'll know something's wrong. They're expecting the train. They'll send people. They better hurry. Just stay with her. If she wakes up, give her three drops of laudanum in a glass of water. You haven't heard of this? No. Oh, it's in all the books for tourists. The male postillion fought in Jidu Purum Rai. And in English? My postillion has been struck by lightning. Oh, wonderful. I'm sure women need to say that every day in Portugal. We should go there. Portugal is only about a week's boat ride away. Llewellyn, I... <laughs> Make up an excuse. You have a dear old uncle in Porto, and you must see him before he dies. I couldn't. Well, then, at least let's go to my place. No, we're going to the track. You don't know what it's like with the baby at home. I, I love Samuel, but I need a break. <laughs> I haven't placed a bet since 1902 when I lost every penny I had. Well, then today you can lose your money buying us drinks. As you wish. Now, how many horses are there? This is hard. How are Miss Newsom and Inspector Brackenreed? The inspector's as stubborn as ever. He 
refused an examination. But I'm worried about Effie. Her leg was badly injured in the crash. Well, she'll be all right. We'll see. This is Mrs. Dooley. I've cleaned and dressed her wounds. The porter found the first aid kit for me. It looks good. You did well. It's a lot different working on live bodies. Excuse me? Oh, I'm a coroner. Well, you're a little early to the party, aren't you? <laughs> Dr. Ogden, could I have a word? Did you find out anything? I spoke to the engineer. He said the brakes were checked at the last station. They were in perfect order. Now they're not. Someone tampered with them? You think so? But if the brakes were in order when we left the last station, then whoever tampered with them was on this train? Who derailed the train that they were traveling on? It's too dangerous. It doesn't make any sense. Just checking on people, seeing if they're doing all right. Luckily, I'm a doctor, and we have the coroner on board as well. No. Hopefully, his services won't be needed. Uh, her services, and yes, I think we've escaped that just. All right. How about the people in the cargo car? Who's in there? A Toronto policeman traveling with another man. They wanted to sit by themselves. In the cargo car? Why? I don't know. Let's have a look. I don't have to ask, do I? No. You don't need to ask how, either. Look at the handcuffs. I'm guessing the prisoner killed him. And now he's on the run. killer tore off his suspenders. You'd have thought he'd taken his jacket and cap as a disguise. This must be his satchel. If the shard went through the jugular, he would have died very quickly. Poor bastard. Walter Rydell. It seems he was escorting a prisoner by the name of Ben Miller from Rochester jail to Toronto. Do you think this Ben Miller took advantage of the crash, killed his escort, and then made his escape? Or he killed him first. Then he derailed the train as a diversion. Then he made his escape. Hmm. I have work to do, baby Jordan. we need is a safe, contained area for you to play in. Hmm. How is she? She woke up in pain, so I gave her more laudanum. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else I can do? Just stay with her. If the leg starts to swell, let me know. The two passengers nearest the cargo car door, they didn't even know there was anyone in there. They didn't see anyone go in or out before the crash. Well, if they're correct, then Ben Miller didn't leave to tamper with the brakes. And if Ben Miller didn't derail the train... He had an accomplice. Pinsky! I want a word. Exactly where were you when the train derailed? Why do you want to know? I was talking to your engineer. He said you left your post just before the crash. That seems a bit suspicious to me. Huh, like I said, I was in the privy. Where are the angle cop valves that you were telling me about? Uh, I've been checking the valves, and the only ones turned off were at the back of the engine car. And? I wasn't there. I'll ask around, see if anyone saw you there. Mm -hmm. You would have had to pass that valve to get to where you were going. Sure, I suppose. Do you know a man named Ben Miller? No. No, who's that? That's the man that the constable was bringing to Toronto. They were in the cargo car. No, I swear to you, I, I have no idea who that is. Do I need to talk to your engineer? All right. I may as well tell you now. I was in jail five years ago for petty theft, but now I got a wife and a child, and I wouldn't risk that life I built for anything. I'm looking for an escaped convict. Are you going to help me or not? 
I may have seen the man you're looking for after the derailment. I'm listening. After I was done checking the valves, I saw someone. He was on the other side of the train. Are you all right? Never mind me, never mind. Did you get a good look at him? No, I didn't see his face. I just saw his tall, brown boots. Show me where you saw him. So he was standing up here, then he went off in that direction. What's that? It's blood. It was the man you saw bleeding? I don't know. Blood leads to the door. If that's Ben Miller, he got back on the train. Oh, right. Here we are. Perfect little spot for baby Jordan. Oh, I know. You must be hungry. Would you like? Mm. Uh, what about some milk? No? Mm. Uh, this is a book I wrote. I have several copies left over. Perhaps you... No. Perhaps not. What about this? I know. Uh, wait right here. Watch it. I've given you seven stitches. Don't put any pressure on the leg. They'll open up. You're tying it too tight. Look, I'm a coroner, I'm not a doctor, but I'm the best you've got right now. Now, have a seat if you'd like, but stay off it as best you can. Fine. Violet, how are you? Oh, better now that I've seen to everyone. How does it feel to stitch up living people? It took some getting used to. I stitched up a man's wound fairly well. It, it would have been more serious, but he tied suspenders above the wound. Suspenders? Were they his own? Um, I'm not sure. Could you find the inspector, please? Tell him to come here, quickly. I'll be right back. Hello, baby Jordan. I can see you. Well, I think I've done it. With the help of this device, I'll be able to control the drone, which will be buoyed by large balloons, and fans will help control the direction so I'm able to take a photograph from exactly where I want. But first, I have to inflate the balloons. Mrs. Hart said you wanted to see me. There's a man on this car with a gash on his leg. He used these suspenders as a tourniquet. Suspenders? Which man? There, with the hat over his eyes. Are you all right? You look very pale. I'm fine. The fireman just told me that he saw a man get off the train after the derailment, who then got back on. He was bleeding. He must have been wounded, then taken Rydell's suspenders to staunch the bleeding. That's him. Excuse me, sir. Are you Ben Miller? Oh, come back here! Oh, I said stop! Excuse me. Excuse me!
Thomas! Get his shirt open now. Did Miller do this? I think he sustained an injury in the crash. His pulse is very weak. Check his left side. There's a large discoloration. Slightly internal bleeding. An organ rupture? We don't know. We'll have to operate. Anything I can do? Find the porter. We need towels and hot water as much as he can muster. First, uh, help us get him up onto some of these crates. Jordan? Jordan? Maybe Jordan? 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 What are you? How did you? Murray Marble's two mover. I've had the pieces set up for weeks and I can't solve it. You are one troublesome baby. Very sweet, but troublesome. I have a boatload of work left to do and I can't take my eyes off of you for one second. I could, oh, that's too drastic. We could work. Oh. There you are. I'm going to go do a bit of work. Why don't you have a nap or, or play with your doll? Very good. Uh. Right. Hopefully she won't remember this. Keep absorbing the blood, Violet. I'm trying. There's so much. I was worried it was collecting in the peritoneal cavity, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Are there spleen or colon ruptured? They're intact. Oh, that's a relief. But I still can't find the burst blood vessel. I'm running out of towels. Put your hand there. I can't see where the blood is coming from. Steady, Violet. How are you feeling? I'm scared. My leg hurts so badly. What if I can't walk again? You'll be fine. How do you know? Because Dr. Ogden said you'll heal in no time. Why are you being so nice to me? I'm just trying to make sweet so I can get an exclusive interview about your kidnapping. That was six months ago. Did you have to bring that up? Sorry. Bad attempt at a joke. You probably think I should be over it by now. Nonsense. You're kidnapped. It's gonna take time to heal. Please change the subject. Do you and George plan to get married? I don't know. Every time I look at George, I remember what happened. You had nothing to do with it. I know, but they are still out there. Perhaps it would be best for George and I if we never marry. And let them win. You're better than that. You two will find a way. Careful. I'm going to tell people you have a heart. <laughs> now you've gone too far. <laughs> I need some more. More of the... You've had two doses already. Dr. Ogden says that you should have plain water. Two drops. I'm almost finished the exterior incision. Are you sure the blood vessel stitches will hold? As sure as I can be. Are you feeling all right? Yes, why? Your hands are shaking a little. I haven't had anything to eat or drink today. It must be catching up with me. Well, I finished the stitching. Just need to clean the area one more time. If you don't need me anymore, I'm going to get some air. Of course.
Where is my screwdriver? Jordan. Oh. Oh, baby Jordan, what is it? No. No. It's all right. Huh. My goodness. Where is your doll? What have you done with your... Uh, right here. How on earth did you get this all the way under... Oh. Um, Jordan? What have you done? Jordan, get the keys. Get the keys. Yes. Yes. Oh, very good. Yes. Yes. Bring the keys to me. Jordan. Jordan, please. Please. No, come back. No, no. Jordan, come back. The, the keys, Jordan. Jordan, come back. Hello. Help someone. Excuse me, can you help me, please? Yes, ma'am. I've been knocking at this lavatory door for 10 minutes. Did you see anyone go in there? No, but the door is locked. Is anyone in there? Hello? Is anyone in there? Whoa! Oh! What's wrong? Mr. Adams, get the door open. I think I should leave him in here and lock the door and we can Mr. wait. Mr. Adams, let me through, please. We should leave him be. Just a minute. One large cut to the throat. Severing the left carotid artery. I'm not seeing any defensive wounds. Might have been forced into the lavatory and then murdered. I'm going to lock the door now, ladies, and we can wait for the authorities. Mr. Adams, for all intents and purposes, right now, we are the authorities. So please, just stand back and let us work. If you insist found this in the pocket. We found this on Ben Miller. It's his transfer paper from the Rochester jail. He was released into the custody of Mr. Rydell to be a witness in a court case. But well, we were wrong. About what? Whoever derailed the train. We thought it was someone on Miller's side, an accomplice helping him escape. So why would this person kill him? To stop him from testifying, perhaps? Or protecting themselves? Or save whomever's on trial? Whatever the reason, there's a killer on the loose. Oh. Sir? Henry, what's going on? Let me out. How did you get locked in the cell, sir? I can explain. Well, first I had baby Jordan locked in the cell. Yeah. You put my baby daughter in jail? What did she do? Oh, no, no, Henry, no. I was outside working on my aerial surveillance camera. I can't believe you'd put a baby in jail. My baby in jail? Well, she's quite the little escape artist. Well, where is she now? She escaped. What? You lost my daughter? Oh. Oh. Jordan! Jordan! Jordan? Jordan? Henry! Henry! What is it? I left the Nipkow disc running. It may have recorded which way Jordan went. Well, well, hurry! We have to find her! She'd be somewhere around here? That, that was her! She crawled past your office? Looks like she was headed toward the front door. Where is she? Uh... Do you uh, see her? She can't have gotten very far. Henry, there's a, a possibility... A possibility of what? A possibility she may be up. 
What? Well, well, get her down! Well, I, I can't find the room. Get her down now! My baby's up there! Do you think Miller knew someone on the train wanted to kill him? Probably not, or he would have taken his chances escaping, even with a serious injury. If he'd run the train again, I'm fairly certain there's no one missing. So whoever killed Miller is still on this train? Let's keep close together. I'm going to check on the inspector. I just said we should stay close together. I can look after myself. Thank you, Mrs. Hart. Oh, Mr. Adams. Did you see anyone near the lavatory before we found Ben Miller? No, I didn't. Though I've been wondering about that fireman being in the area. Fireman? Mr. Pinsky. Your friend, the inspector, has talked with him a few times. I think with some suspicion. Is that so? Did you know Mr. Pinsky is an ex-convict? No, I haven't spoken with him. I don't know about his personal life, but... maybe he still has one foot in the criminal world. Mr. Pinsky. That's me. Uh, I'm Dr. Ogden, traveling with the inspector. May I ask where you've been since you spoke with him last? Oh, you think I had anything to do with that man found dead? Just answer the question, Mr. Pinsky. I already spoke to you, Inspector, and I'm gonna tell you what I told him. I had nothing to do with that train derailing, and I certainly had nothing to do with any murder. I never heard of any Ben Miller before today. You haven't answered the question. I was outside, smoking. Alone? Look, I can't be around Sitwell, the engineer. He hates me, I hate him. But I, I, I was talking to Cliff, the porter, for a while. But that's it. You know everything there is to know about this train, don't you, Mr. Pinsky? You'd know how to derail it. Perhaps you're doing someone a favor. Look, I'm straight now. I wouldn't risk my job or my family for anybody or anything again. I told all this to the inspector. Could you empty your pockets, Mr. Pinsky? No, no. If you're innocent as you claim, you won't mind. <sighs> Explain that, Mr. Pinsky. I've never seen that before. This was used to kill Ben Miller. I never killed anybody that's not mine. You're going to be locked up until the police arrive. No, I'm not. I never did anything. Get into the pantry. There's no way I'm going to let you women tell me what to do. Mr. Adams, can you help us get him in? No, I'll tell you. No. Let me go. Let me go. Lock the door. Well done, everyone. I can't. Well, figure it out. But, Henry, I don't know how. Aren't you supposed to be the smart one? About most things, yes. Uh, perhaps we could use something. Use what? That's not going to be long enough. No. No. Do you suppose we could shoot it down? With a gun? No. No? No. No. Oh. Well, it, it, it's going up. Perhaps we can catch it from the roof. The roof, yes. Very good. Let's go. Oh, wait, wait. It's heading toward those wires. I... Oh. Oh, Jordan! Oh! Jordan! Oh. Jordan? Look who we found. Oh, Jordan. My remote control. Uh, the baby was playing with it. We were walking past and found this little one sitting on the ground. And then, uh, this. You really should be more careful, Henry. Oh, oh Jordan, I told you. Oh, you scared me. Effie, how are you? I feel so woozy from that laudanum. I've never had it before. I feel as if I've been removed from my body. I suppose right now that's a good thing. Your pulse is strong. Can you feel anything in your leg? Uh, That's a good thing. I heard some shouting. Well, we did find out who killed Ben Miller and derailed the train. It was the fireman, Mr. Pinsky. Well, where is he now? Locked in the pantry. Did he jingle? Did he jingle? The man, the man, the man who killed the other man. I think you need a little more rest, Effie. They came right 
by me, a man in brown boots limping, and a man in black boots is jingling. They're over by the lavatory. They, they had a bit of a scuffle. Did you see anything, Mrs. Dooley? Uh, no, dear, I'm afraid I didn't. But I did see the fireman you're talking about, Mr. Pinsky. When? Before the crash, he was on the runner board near the passenger car, whistling as if he didn't have a care in the world. That doesn't prove anything. I didn't say it does. But I saw him outside, too, after the Miller man escaped. Are you sure? He was having a few nips from his flask. Maybe he didn't like to tell you ladies. Are we sure it's Mr. Rensky? He did have the murder weapon on him. What's his connection to Ben Miller? Mr. Adams. Hmm? Oh. I've been trying to piece together what happened today, and there's something that's bothering me. Did you see Mr. Pinsky at all in the train? It seems to me he spent the day outside. No one saw anyone near a laboratory when um, Mr. Miller was killed. And he still had the murder weapon in his pocket. Why would he keep it, not try to hide it? <laughs> I don't claim to know the minds of men. Well, you said it was Pinsky. We'll just keep him locked up till the help comes. Yes. But there could be another suspect on the train. Perhaps someone who knew Mr. Miller? Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> you should just let this go. <laughs> well, I've learned to trust my instincts when they're telling me something isn't right. Just leave it alone. <laughs> Did you have anything to do with derailing this train, Mr. Adams? Uh, I can't believe this. Well, I can let this go for now, but uh, perhaps there's a connection between you and Mr. Miller that you're not telling us about. You just keep sticking your nose where it don't belong. You don't understand. Tell me, Mr. Adams, help me understand. Ben Miller was gonna testify against my brother. And he'd be lying just to keep himself out of jail. I couldn't prove it, but he'd be lying. And I had to stop him. So you killed him? and planted the razor on Mr. Pinsky? I wouldn't have had to frame Pinsky if it wasn't for your meddling. <laughs> now I'm gonna have to take care of you. Don't be stupid. I see now you are. I let you go, you won't forget this. I don't wanna do this. You left me no choice. <laughs> <laughs> the trick. What are you doing up after your surgery? You're welcome. Come inside. All right, Jordan. Here we go. I, I suppose I should thank you for taking care of her today. Oh, Henry, I am so sorry about what's happened today. I don't apologize, sir. Watching a crawling baby is tricky, even for a great detective. <laughs> Henry... Do you ever wonder if... What? If perhaps baby Jordan is highly advanced for her age. You mean a genius? Well, I've never considered that. Of course, you're a bright baby. I suppose I've never felt outsmarted by her. I've never had need to really consider that. No. no, of course not. Never mind. <laughs> Uh, sir, I think it might be best if we never mention today to Ruth. I would appreciate that. In fact, I think it may be best we never speak of it again. Henry? Yes, sir? Henry... Someone has solved my chest problem. It's been here for weeks. And aside from you, no one else has been in this room except for baby Jordan. <laughs> well, that's impossible, sir. <laughs> Girls can't play chess. 
Oh, the tech. believe you fought the porter inspector in your condition tough as old boots me yes you are old boots brown boots black boots okay well, close your eyes and get some rest can i have some more of that drink i think you've had quite enough i think you've had quite enough so mr adams brother is on trial and he wanted to stop mr miller from testifying against him apparently he truly believed his brother is innocent and risked everyone's lives on the train to help him win his court case but we're all still alive. Thanks to Dr. Ogden. And Mrs. Hart. Thank you, Violet. Good job. Oh, I hear something. Oh, thank God. Doctor, you should go and talk to whoever's in charge. There's lots to explain. Yes, I will. As soon as I get you and Effie off to the closest hospital. Do they have some more of that drink there? They'll have lots and lots and lots of it. We better go. Today was exactly what I needed. Mm. For me to buy the drinks all afternoon? Uh, that and a bit of uh, spirited shouting. Uh, it is strangely cathartic, isn't it? Still early? Could go back to your place? Uh, yes, there's a book I want to lend you. Martin Eden, Jack London's latest. It sounds good. There's uh, Claire. Oh, with Samuel. <clears throat> uh, suppose you have to go? Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Samuel cried all afternoon. I had to take him for a walk to pump both our nerves. He loves the fresh air. He does. But he missed his father. <laughs> Let's go home. Detective Murdoch. <laughs> Calm down, Irving. What is it? There might be a problem. Thank you for walking me to work, George. Not at all. How's your leg? It's fine. I haven't been to my office in months. It's understandable. If you've been through a terrible ordeal, you've not been in the right frame of mind. I have not. And, and besides, you've enough money that you needn't rush back if you don't want to. It's not just that. I feel like perhaps it's time I put my law career behind me. I might do something new. Oh, dancer. No, horse jockey. No, Gibraltar Point Lighthouse keeper. I'm serious, George. Well, who's to say I'm not? Although, if you're the jockey, I can't imagine the height of a horse. <laughs> there you are, George. Oh, I need uh, your assistance. Sorry. Fairly Hotel, room 14. Yeah, uh, what's the matter? We'll know when we get there. Uh, right. Giddy up. Hello, Toronto Constabulary. Huh? Ma'am, please step away. State your business. Is this your room? Can you tell me how you came to be in the room of a dead man? I came in through the door. But I had nothing to do with this. And your name? It's... Georgie! Aunt Zinnia? Who was this man? His name was Juan de Leon. I just met him last night. What were you doing in his room? I don't want to say. Well, Anzania, just tell the detective the truth. I met him and lost my head. He was so handsome. <laughs> Did you stay the night? What kind of lady do you take me for? So you came to his room this morning? I couldn't stop thinking about him. I came to his room, the door was open, he was lying there, and then you came in. Good day, Mrs. Hart. Detective? Uh, sir. There's no way my aunt could have done this. You know her well, then. Well, I used to, and she's hardly the murdering kind. 
All right, escort your aunt down to the station house. I'll see what I can find out about Mr. De Leon. Right. Uh, aunt Zinnia, come with me. Oh, that poor man. Such a shame. Don't you agree, Georgie? Mrs. Hart? He was struck once with a slim, heavy object. No defensive wounds. Time of death? Recently. Rigor mortis has just barely begun. I'll know more once I examine the body. Spanish man. Brown hair, thin mustache. Yeah, I threw him out of here last night. Never cared for his type. I don't quite take your meaning. The type that separates wealthy older women from all their money. The confidence man. All I know is he made straight for an elderly lady here last night, and she was dripping in diamonds. Sits down with her, starts ordering champagne. All on her tab, of course. So I asked him to leave. Told him I was on to him. This way, Aunt Zinnia, I'll get you a seat. I'm so sorry about all this, Georgie. I didn't even know you were in Toronto. You should have called. Well, I've only recently arrived. I, I was waiting until I was a bit more settled, and now I'm the furthest thing from it. Listen, were you completely truthful with Detective Murlock and I? What were you doing in that man's room? What can I say, Georgie? He caught my eye, and I his. I see. George, there's something I didn't tell you. He may have had a necklace of mine. Did you give it to him? George, he may have taken it from me. I went to his room to look for it, but... But he was dead? On my word, George. <sighs> there, there. Perhaps you could ask the constables to have a look. It's gold with a... Quiche pendant on it. Well, if it turns up, we'll certainly let you know. Thank you. What a hat. Why, this old thing? I often wondered what I'd wear to a police station. I've never been to one before. Huh. Uh, what brings you here? Uh, Detective Watts, this is my Aunt Zinnia. Your Aunt Zinnia? Pleased to meet you. Are you here for a visit? Unfortunately, I'm here under suspicion of murder. Oh, dear. Well, if you're innocent, you're in the best hands. If you're guilty... Good day. She was in the dead man's room. I hate to say it, Crabtree. D uh, sir, she was looking for her necklace. He took it from her. <laughs> she could be lying. I don't know, sir. I, I spoke to a bartender who saw Juan de Leon last night. And? He had to kick him out. Believed him to be a romantic swindler. Hmm. You know, I often wondered how one gets into that line of work. Uh, more of a calling, I suspect, sir. Uh, and you'd need to have very few scruples. And, of course, you'd also need to be handsome. What exactly are you implying, Crabtree? I've managed to track down the woman that Juan de Leon was swindling last night. A constable is bringing her in. Sir, do you think it would be possible to release my aunt? I highly doubt she's done anything wrong here. <laughs> Let me sort this out first, George. Right. I'm so sorry I couldn't be more help to you. Well, thank you for coming in. Oh, such a shame. Mr. De Leon was so handsome. Mm. Miss O'Neill. Miss O'Neill? Alberta! Fancy meeting you here. What brings you to a police station? Well, I was just visiting my dear nephew, George Crabtree. Oh. Your Irish love potion worked to treat last night. Not an hour after you had me put it in my drink, I met the most wonderful man. You did? But then... Mr. De Leon was thrown out of the establishment. Oh, my stars and garters. He gave me his card. And I must confess, I was going to call on him, but then he turned up dead. I will be wanting to purchase more of your love potion. At your convenience, of course. <clears throat> Thank you. I can explain. I met Juan last night, and he asked me to help him with a silly little trick. 
I'd never done anything like that before. I did it for the thrill. You gave Miss Vinci love potion. It was just colored water. He asked me to speak to the old dear, have her put it in her drink. I left. He came in and charmed her. Aunt Zinnia. He asked the lady for a few dollars, and the lady gets a lovely evening. What's the harm? And it was just the once, you swear. On my life, Georgie. Don't be overly dramatic, dear. It's not that dire. <laughs> Dr. Deakins, can I be of assistance? No, Dr. Ogden. I'm quite capable of handling a patient, even one as hysterical as Miss Robinson. <gasps> I'm in so much pain, doctor. Give her a dose of morphine and put her in the ward, nurse. I must dash, but prep her tomorrow for a lithotripsy. <laughs> so the diagnosis is a kidney stone? That's what the doctor said. <laughs> Mr. Clavel, please, have a seat. Yes. <sighs> Thank you for seeing me. What can I help you with? I am a private investigator. Ah. Oh. And? I've been hired to locate $10,000 that Juan de Leon swindled my client out of. Now that he's dead, my job has become a touch more difficult. My condolences. Who is your client? Ah, she would prefer not to be named. I'm sure you understand. I see. Mm -hmm. um, I also hear that you have a Miss Zinnia Hobson in custody. How do you know that? Well, I've been tracking her and Mr. DeLeon. Both of them? Detective Murdoch. They work as a team. So if he's dead, then she most certainly has my client's money. How may I be of assistance with this? There are constables guarding Mr. DeLeon and, um, and Miss Hobson's rooms. Could I be granted access? There, um, there may be something in there that could, uh, uh, be something in there that might aid my investigation. And I'm sorry, but no. There's already an ongoing investigation. Mine. Right. Sir? Uh, Pardon the intrusion, but uh, I've brought some items from the crime scene you're going to want to have a look at. Oh, may I? Uh, Mr. Covell, no. Good day. And you thought to clutter up my desk with evidence, did you? Well, I was told that the man in the detective's office was snooping around the case. I thought it wise. Good thinking, Henry. Huh. Thank you, sir. Oh, I'll see you get a medal, Heans. Well, there's still blood on the poker. Could be the murder weapon. Is the Pope a Catholic? <clears throat> Where was it found? Uh, both items were found just outside the window of Mr. De Leon's room. Any finger marks on the poker? No, but the handkerchief does appear to have some initials on it. Z.H. Zinnia Hobson. I'm sorry, George. I don't believe it. Well, bug looks, it would appear that your dear old auntie is a thief and a murderer. I must have left my handkerchief in Juan's room last night. Miss Hobson, I happen to know that you and Mr. De Leon are confidence tricksters that have been working together for some time. I also know the two of you recently have come into $10,000. What? Did you fight over the money? Why split $10,000 when you could have it all? You've got it all wrong. Yes, Juan and I work together. And yes, we may have relieved some ladies of their extra wealth, but not $10,000. Miss Hobson, that will save us all a lot of time if you are completely honest with me right now. If we had $10,000, we would not be in this godforsaken town. Juan and I were in love. I had no reason to kill him. And you just happened to be rifling through his personal effects at the very moment that I entered the room. I walked in. One was lying there dead, and I panicked. I was trying to take anything that would lead to me. 
but I swear on a stack of Bibles, I am innocent. You'll forgive me if, given what I know, I don't take your word for it. <laughs> Miss Robinson, how are you feeling? No better. May I examine you? You're not my doctor. Yes, but I am one, and I may be able to help you. What are you doing? According to Miss Robinson's chart, Dr. Deacons never gave her a proper physical exam. You shouldn't be doing this. But I am. Dr. Deacons isn't going to like this. I'm not concerned with what Dr. Deacons likes or doesn't like. This woman has ovarian torsion. I can feel her swollen ovary. Oh. The doctor said it was just hysteria. Well, he was wrong. We need to prepare the operating theater. This patient needs surgery now. I could lose my job. If you're not prepared to help me, please find someone who will. We're wasting time here. Will I be all right? Yes, of course. At least consider representing her. George, I haven't practiced law in months. My Aunt Zinnia needs you. George! At least talk to her. She's a wonderful lady. I mean, does she bend the law from time to time, perhaps? But she's no murderer. You need a real lawyer. You are a real lawyer. And besides, I trust you, Effie. That's all that matters. And you know what? Before you give up law, perhaps the old horse needs to be ridden again. The old tall horse. What does her case look like? It's dire. Um, the evidence against her is piling up, but I know she's innocent. Your Aunt Zinnia needs more than just your belief of her innocence, George. Yes, exactly. She needs you. The hotel sent over the personal items from your room. Do you need any of these things while you're in here? You're so good to your aunt. Oh, Juan gave this to me just yesterday. You told the detective he didn't have any money. And that's true. I have no idea how he got it. Probably stole it. Uh, well, this chap sounds like a real prize. Who are you? Miss Hobson, I am Effie Newsom. I will be your lawyer. A lady lawyer? Fantastic. Uh, not just your lawyer, Anthony. Effie and I have been seeing each other for some time. Oh! <laughs> oh, you're Georgie's girl. You're so pretty. Oh, thank you, Miss Hobson. <laughs> Zinnia, you know, we probably shouldn't have given George all that copy when he was a young man. I, I do think it stunted his growth. All right, now. Well, let's get to the matter at hand. Uh, please, sit. Now, tell me everything you can about this $10,000. Oh, like I've told anyone who will listen, I know nothing about the money. I only know that the man I thought loved me is dead. Nothing else? And the necklace is gone. The necklace he stole? I know I told you that Juan stole the necklace, but the truth is, we both have one. We divided up the key to our safety deposit box. That way we could take out and put in money together. So you two didn't trust each other then? What we sowed together, we reaped together. Juan wore his half key on a chain. When I saw him this morning, it was gone. Who else knew about the key? No one. Whoever is looking for the keys to the box is in for a big surprise. There's no money in it. All right, now, is this the truth? Absolutely, George. I cannot believe you don't believe me. George, could you give us a minute, please? What? I'm our counsel. Our conversations are privileged. Oh. Yes, of course. Now, Miss Hobson. Zinnia. Zinnia. I need you to tell me the whole truth if I'm going to help you. I am telling you the truth, dear. So Mr. DeLeon's half of the key is missing. And Zinnia claims that no one else even knew about the other half of the key. Even more evidence that points towards her, George. Well, yes, sir, but to what end? I mean, Aunt Zinnia paints him as love's young dream. And with no money to fight over. And that we know of. There has to be something else. Something that we're missing. 
Are the constables still at the crime scene? We released them this afternoon. Do you mind if I had a look? By all means. But you had best steel yourself, George, for a possible bad outcome. Sir, I know how it looks, but she didn't do it. I'm sure of it. What the devil are you doing? I'm in the middle of surgery. Do not disturb me now. But I am the physician. Out! This is not the last I one. said now! Was there anybody else who may have seen Miss Hobson enter or exit her room? Mm -mm. Right. Well, thank you anyway. Uh, miss, that room is a crime scene. You've just... Hey, stop! Hold right there! Well, come in with me. I didn't do anything. Well, I'll decide that. Miss Viola Treatley, what were you doing in Juan de Leon's room? When the desk clerk told me what happened to Juan, I was so upset. I, I just, I wanted to take a memento to remember Juan by. And how did you know uh, Juan de Leon? We were in love. We were going to go away together. You were not. He was in love with my aunt. George, please. Where were you early this morning? On a train, coming back from visiting my sister in Peterborough. I see. And were you aware of what Mr. De Leon did for a living? There's no point in lying. Yes, I did. And I knew who he was partners with as well. Zinnia Hobson. What did you know about her? Just that she was a lying thief. Uh, pot calling the kettle black, if you ask me. George. Zinnia must have found out about Juan and I. And she must have found out about the $10,000 that he had. You knew about this sum of money? He got it two weeks ago. He told me Zinnia didn't know anything about it. He was double-crossing her? Well, he was keeping it for us, so that we could run away together. Zinnia must have found out somehow. She did this to Juan. I just know that she did. Georgie, no. That, that can't be true. Zinnia... Viola Treatley has just told the detective and I all about her love affair with Mr. De Leon. Well then, to heck with him. I suppose he didn't care about me, so I don't care about him. More importantly, Miss Hobson, you have lied to us at every turn. If I were you, now would be the time to avail yourself of the truth. What is in it for my client if she cooperates? It may spare her the noose. Sir. The charge is murder, George. All right. You want the truth? We were going to take a pigeon for $10,000, but it didn't pan out. Antonia. Or at least I thought it didn't pan out. Apparently Juan lied to me. But I did not kill him. I swear. I loved him. And he did not love me back. Who was the pigeon? It might be best that you answer. Leniency for cooperation, detective? What do you say? Mm. May I offer you a long, cool drink, detective? Oh, thank you. We understand a Mr. Juan de Leon cheated you out of a substantial sum of money. It is a bit embarrassing. Well, I'm sure Mr. de Leon was very convincing. <laughs> oh, yes. He told me he was a scion of a very wealthy Spanish family. He was involved in building a children's hospital outside of Barcelona. But his family lost all their money in that anarchist uprising last month. 
Oh, I know how foolish it sounds now. But he was so convincing. What happened after you gave him the money? That was the last I ever heard of him. Well, you never contacted the police. I wanted to save my children the embarrassment. Myself as well, truth be told. So instead you hired Mr. Quivell? Who? The private investigator. I didn't hire a private investigator. Did you know Mr. DeLeon was staying at the Brearley Hotel? No, dear. I don't know where he is. He could be halfway to Timbuktu by now. Mrs. McCall, can you explain why you are painting a portrait of Anthony Quivell? Him? <laughs> why, that's my son, Owen. Thank you. Dr. Ogden. Dr. Ogden. Dr. Deacons. You have no right You'll to... be pleased to know that your patient is doing very well, despite your irresponsible diagnosis. Now, wait just one moment. A diagnosis that, if left long enough, could have killed her. Do you demand praise for correcting me, Dr. Ogden? That smacks of vanity. This isn't about me, Dr. Deacons. You didn't even bother to give her a physical examination. I believe my diagnosis was correct based on what she told me. You considered her a weak, hysterical female, and that's why you didn't diagnose her properly. You are impugning my reputation as a doctor, and I warn you, it won't end well. For whom, Dr. Deacons? George. Detective. Effie, interesting development. It turns out Anthony Quivell is not Anthony Quivell, private investigator, but rather Owen McCall, Mrs. McCall's McCall. son. son. Really? Oh, well, I think he's the one who might have killed Mr. DeLeon for the $10,000. A, a sum my client maintains she knows nothing about. So she says. Well, so she said she didn't. I might have something. What's that? This same private investigator came to my office today. He, he wanted to speak to my client. My aunt? Yes, George, we're aware. I refused, of course. What did he want with her? Well, I don't know. I terminated the conversation. If he found half of the safety deposit key that was around Mr. De Leon's neck, then perhaps he's seeking its companion. Let him have this key? Are you crazy? Listen to the detective. Zinni, if you cooperate, I may be willing to look past your involvement in defrauding Mrs. McCall. Just that one? Don't push me. What do you need me to do? We let Mr. McCall steal your key. If he tries to access your safety deposit box, we'll know that he killed Mr. De Leon. Why not just give him the key? Because he would then know that we're onto him. Now, please ask Mr. McCall, a.k.a. Anthony Quivell, to come to the station house. Sir. You do have a little larceny in your heart, detective. Only when called for. Now, we just need him to steal that key. How do we do that? Oh, come now, Miss Hobson. Don't disappoint me. I thought you were an accomplished con woman. All right. But we're going to need some extra players to complete the charade. Gentlemen. I suppose you know why I called you in here today, Dr. Ogden? Yes, I believe I have an idea. You went against a fellow doctor's diagnosis, then you made him look like a fool in the hospital corridors for everyone to see. I saved that woman from grave illness. Be that as it may, I'm afraid there's more at stake here. But Dr. Deacon's misdiagnosis almost cost a woman her life. If doctors are to publicly question fellow doctors' judgment, where would we be? Uh, forgive me, Dr. Forbes, but it sounds as though you're putting one doctor's self-esteem above the health of a patient. You are unprofessional and disruptive, and certainly not the first time. I must ask you to apologize to Dr. Deacons immediately. I must apologize to him. Yes, at once. Good day, doctor. <sighs> Mr. Covell, I wanted to update you on our investigation as a professional courtesy. I appreciate that. Has some new evidence come to light with regard to Miss Sidney Hobson? Well, no. 
we now believe the person who murdered Juan de Leon was motivated not by money, but jealous revenge. Interesting. You see, Miss Hobson had another partner in... partner in crime before Juan de Leon, a Mr. Hugh St. Clair. And, and, and what is his part in all this? We believe that Mr. St. Clair also has the money that you are after, <laughs> on behalf of your client, of course. I am free as a bird. You won't be seeing me again, Constable. Now, where are my things? You're releasing Zinnia Hobson? Yes and no. You see, we believe that Mr. St. Clair will try to contact Xenia Hobson. He's been very elusive thus far. We are going to follow Miss Hobson, and when the two finally connect, we'll nab him. And what do we know about the St. Clair fellow? He's known to us. Keep an eye out for this man. Sir, is this quite necessary? Uh, I, I give you my word, Aunt Cindy will not try to escape. Well, thank you, George. And as much as I appreciate your word, I don't quite trust your aunts yet. You know, a lesser woman than I would take offense. What is that? I've been working on reducing the size of my tracking device. All I require now is this and a receiver to emit a sound when in proximity to the device. You mean I'm supposed to wear this? On your ankle. It's very discreet, I assure you. Will you help me try it on? I'm sure George can help you with that. All right. Brearley Hotel tonight. Right. Your detective. He's quite something. He is indeed. I'm quite fortunate to have learned under his tutelage. I wasn't talking about his level of education. Is he married? Yes, happily, unfortunately for you. Well, that's a pity. George, I'm sorry I've turned your life upside down. Well, you wouldn't be my Aunt Zinnia if you hadn't. <laughs> All right, give us a leg. Dr. Deakins, may I have a word? Of course. I gather you've spoken with Dr. Forbes. Yes. It's unfortunate that you chose to speak with him about our conversation. That wasn't a conversation. That was you hysterically overreacting. <laughs> Do you believe that all women who dare disagree with you are hysterical? I thought this was meant to be an apology. I know that it was wrong to speak to you the way that I did, and... You did more than that. You operated on my patient without my permission. You left without doing a proper physical examination. Where's my apology? One is not being offered, Dr. Deakins. I cannot in good conscience apologize to you when you're so clearly in the wrong. Once again, Dr. Ogden, your emotions get the better of you. Hardly the time, George. To look less suspicious. Uh, two spruce beers, please. Spruce beer. It's an acquired taste, I suppose. Mm -hmm. mm. Zinnia! 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 Hugh, you've got some nerve. I just want to parlay. May I have a seat, honeysuckle? You look as ravishing as ever, darling. You don't fool me with your sweet talk. I know you're mad with jealousy over Juan. Juan? <laughs> I'm the only suitor for you, and you damn well know it. Please forgive me, darling. Please. That's for Juan. 
That's for me! Julio! Uh, Zinnia! Zinnia, don't go, darling! Honeysuckle! I love you! Hugh St. Clair! Toronto Constabulary, you are under arrest for the murder of Juan de Leon. I haven't killed anyone. Now unhand me, Wanda! You are coming with us. No! You can't do this! Make your mind up, woman. I've already lost Juan. <laughs> and now I'll lose Hugh. Let him go, sir. If you continue to protest, I'll be forced to arrest you as well. Oh, well then, carry on. He's gone. Did he take the bait? He did indeed. Should I follow him? No, no, no. We know precisely where he will be. Please escort your aunt back to the station house. I'm not free to go? Let's see how this plays out tomorrow. Right. Uh, Inspector, that was, uh, something else. <sighs> it's been a while since I trod the boards, Murdoch. If music be the food of love, play on. <laughs> one doesn't forget one's first love, Murdoch, does one? <laughs> Yes, sir. You certainly mustered every ounce of talent you have to pull off such a convincing Lothario. Thank you, madam. <laughs> Hang on a sec. Good morning. How may I help you? Good morning. I was hoping to open a savings account. A savings account? Yes. And to that end, here is $5 for my initial deposit. Oh, I see. Nothing more? Ah, uh, no. Please just honor my wishes. Yes, of course. Uh, let me just find the paperwork. Take your time. You're sure that's all I can help you with? See, that's the thing with you bank fellas. Mm. Man walks in for one thing and... You try and sell him another. Uh, I... A bloody savings account. Wasn't he supposed to go straight to a safety deposit box? That was the idea. I'm calling Walsh. Hello? What the bloody hell is he playing at? I'm afraid I don't have an answer for that. He's on to us. He must have given the key to someone else. Detective, go to the safety deposit room now. Could you excuse me for just a moment? Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to do biz business I'll here. Be, I'll be right back. The deposit box has been opened. standing there. He hasn't moved an inch. He has to be working with someone else. Well, they can't have gone far. You two go and have a gander. I'll keep an eye on Covell. Wait, shouldn't I let them open a savings? What? <clears throat> George, when I get out of jail, I'm going to be a new woman. On the straight and narrow. On Virginia. No, no, I mean it. All my aunts walked a crooked path. Why should you be any different? Oh, Georgie. Don't hate me for that. Not at all. I prefer interesting relations. Although I should return you to the cells. Could I use the lavatory? Well, there's a bucket in the... Yeah, yes, of course. Oh, and Zinni, I don't suppose I would have liked Mr. De Leon very much, but I gather you did, and I'm sorry you lost him. Don't worry, Georgie. I'll find another. Oh, Juan. I knew you wouldn't forsake me. seen a soul who was inside the bank while I was there. Sir, Covell's still in there filling out bloody forms. It's curious. Hardly. You ever been to a bank, Murdoch? 
all the forms and the bollocks you have to fill out. That's why I keep my cash in my pockets and my silver on the floorboards. Very good. That's not what I was referring to. The carriage. What about it? That's the third time it's gone past while I've been standing here. Vel's accomplice, waiting for him to leave. That man's on his way out. Well, sir, you'd best hide. Quivel knows you as Mr. St. Clair. What the devil? Open the door! Hurry! Stop! Pronto Constabulary. Your two passengers are coming with us, sir. Zinni? Zinni? I didn't do anything. That's what they all say. Constable, please escort Miss Treatley and Mr. McCall to the cells. Right away, sir. <laughs> sir? So, Crabtree, where's your aunt? Sir? Well, I should be pleased to hear that we've caught those two. Yes, sir, no, she's just in the, um, having a rest, and I was about to fetch her. <laughs> Even money says she's scarped. No, I don't bet. It's hardly a wager, no, no. I'm just saying. I don't bet. Private investigator has confessed to the murder of Mr. De Leon. I suppose he made the phone call from the hotel. He used his paramour, Miss Treatley, as Mr. De Leon's lover. To murder a man over some money hardly seems worth it. It was more than that, Watts. The man humiliated his mother. Oh, just some bruised pride. She'll live. Bloody hell, Watts. A simple observation. So, Crabtree, where's your auntie? Uh, sir, that's a good question. Uh, an excellent question, in fact. Flew the coop, did she? Yes, I'm afraid so. Ah, I knew it was a sure thing. I asked you to apologize to Dr. Deacons. You failed to do that. Yes, I suppose I did. But, Dr. Forbes, this issue is far greater than one incident with Dr. Deacons. I have seen a pattern of disregard for female patients in this hospital. Oh, have you? Yes, and you can no longer turn a blind eye to it. This neglect is harmful. My job is to support the doctors in this hospital whose professional opinion I trust wholeheartedly. Well, I can give you several examples of times when those professional opinions were wrong. <laughs> Dr. Ogden, I have grown tired of your continuous crusades. My crusades? Nothing is good enough. You're always angry, and you find oppression where there is none. We've been here before, and I can see we'll be here again unless I put a stop to it. What are you saying? Dr. Ogden, you are dismissed from this hospital. You have no right. This is my hospital, and I have the full support of the board. This is not over. So your first case back as a lawyer was a short one. True. I didn't even get to go to court. But I have to say, being busy and useful was a tonic. Well, at least something good came of my aunt's trickery. I hope you don't feel too hurt by her actions, George. They're not a reflection of her love for you. She left me this. What is it? She says she apologizes, and even though she's not going to jail, she's going to live a lawful life from now on. And 
Do you believe her? I'd like to. What would you like to do? I'm starving. Right then. Well, let's get some dinner. Not for food, George. Ah. Well, I think my place is closer. Then, get up. <laughs> Hello? Is someone there? Who is it? No one. It's just music. What do you mean, music? Someone is fooling with you. Why don't you come join me back on the Chesterfield? Your mind is always on one thing. Whatever else would it be on? Now, where were we? I can't stop thinking about that telephone call. Who cares about that? What matters is that you and I are together. That and the fact that your parents are away. It was just strange, that's all. I'll go make us some tea. I'd like some milk in mine, Perry. There's a little in the ice box. Perry! Yes? Did you want something? If you're here for a sugar treat, Halloween is tomorrow. Ah! What are you doing? <laughs> What have you, George? Sir. Irene Robbins, 17 years of age. The family's away for the week. It's a considerable amount of blood. Footprints. Yeah, yes, sir. The photographer's on his way. She died of multiple stab wounds to the sternum and abdomen. By the looks of it, several of them would have been fatal. Suggesting she was killed in anger. Based on the angle of the wounds, he was likely left-handed. Well, very good, Mrs. Hart. Any sign of the murder weapon? Sir, there's a knife right over here. Uh, she was home alone? Uh, no, sir. Her sweetheart is here. Perry Balfour. He was attacked also, but his injuries are relatively minor. Mr. Balfour, is it? I'm Detective Murdoch of the Toronto Constabulary. It's him. The clown, he's back. <laughs> There were rumors about a clown who would terrorize the students after school. What school? Jarvis Collegiate. Did he attack them? Not that I heard. He would follow them home, appear in the night, scare them. But not kill them? I don't know. I only started at Jarvis in the spring. Back then, people would tell stories about him, but no one had seen him since last Halloween. So you've never actually seen him yourself? No. Not until tonight. Tell me what happened exactly. I was in the water closet. I heard Irene scream. I ran out and... She was... He had a knife. I... There was blood everywhere. What did you do? I stopped him. I, I, I got the knife away from him, but it was too late. So he stabbed at you when you confronted him? Yes. So there was no sign of an intruder inside the house before you heard Irene scream? No. But there was a phone call. Telephone call? Who? It was just music, carnival music. Mr. Balfour, where exactly did your altercation with the killer take place? Right over there. Right by where Irene is. So you wrested the knife from the killer there? He was about to stab me, so I, I grabbed his hand. He twisted me around and tried to bring the knife to my throat. I was able to hold him off, but he sliced my arm. So he was behind you then, and he would have used his right hand. 
Yes. So what's all this then? What's... It's Halloween, Inspector. I've decided to partake in a festivity. So we're celebrating pagans now, are we? I've always liked the pagans. They're less uh, pious than the Christians. Oh, what? Are you carving a jack-o'-lantern? I am, and it is coming quite naturally to me. There are two for a nickel at the stand around the corner, if you'd like to try your hand. I believe some of the lads intend to join in. We'll make a contest of it. What's the prize? Art is its own reward. Hmm. Sounds like a waste of a good pumpkin to me. Save the guts. Margaret likes to roast the seeds. To roast them, sir? What for? To eat, Crabtree. To eat? Seeds? The survivor, Perry Balfour, claims he fought with the attacker. He tells a story of a right-handed assailant, but we believe the killer to be left-handed. He's lying? He may be. Meaning what? Well, sir, taking all things into consideration, we have to entertain the possibility that he may be the killer. He's the one dressing up as a clown. Aside from his account, we have no reason to believe there is a clown. He did claim there was a clown lurking around last year. At Jarvis, before he started there, we're looking into it. What makes no sense to my mind is why. Why would anybody think clowns are funny? Hey? Oh, sir, the hideous makeup, the bizarre clothing, a sense of humor that, quite frankly, sir, is probably warping the minds of an entire generation of children. Hmm. Sirs, I attempted to locate the source of the phone call as you requested. We found this at a phone bank in a hotel a block away from the murder. The music from the phone call. A phone bank, you say? Yes, with the receiver off the hook. How far away from the house? Two minutes, maybe less. That fits Balfour's account of the call and the murder. Did anyone see who left it? No, sir. The attendant didn't see a thing. What kind of idiot doesn't remember a clown waltzing into a phone bank? Well, sir, it is Halloween. That's why I despise this holiday, Higgins. Lunatics walking the streets. This seems bizarre to me, sir. When you're done with an apple, you wouldn't roast the seeds and eat them. Detective! Constable! What can you tell me about last night's murder? How did you hear of it? An us? anonymous tip. Well, the investigation is ongoing. We can tell you nothing beyond that, Miss Cherry. That's a shame. If you're looking for the clown, you might want to avail yourself of my help. You know about the clown? Last Halloween, I read an article about a mysterious clown stalking teeners at Jarvis Collegiate. Teeners? Slang for youth in their teenage years. <laughs> That's a silly word. It should be... teenagers. Sir, there was, in fact, a clown terrorizing teena teenagers students last Halloween. According to the members of the Lit, yes. The Lit? Slang for the Literary and Debating Club at Jarvis. They're the ones the clown was stalking. Sinners. What does this have to do with the clown? He took the photos. Stalking teeners, engaging in promiscuous behavior, taking their photos, and distributing them. In order to what? Shame the students? Obviously. You think this is appropriate behavior? But they're nearly adults. They should be able to do as they please without having their goings-on exposed to the world. Anyone engaging in disgraceful liaisons runs the risk of people finding out. I can assure you that nothing like this ever happened when I was in school. The teeners have gone wild! Who are the students in this photograph? I don't know who the boy is, but that's Heather Iverson. Why does that sound familiar? She took her own life shortly after the flyers were distributed. Oh, that's right. Terribly tragic. Shot herself with her father's gun, I believe. So the clown drove this girl to take her own life? And has now turned to murder. Miss Cherry, do you not feel at all guilty for contributing to a poor young girl's suicide? I wrote the truth that my readers demanded of me, as I always do. <laughs> Thank you for your help, Miss Cherry. Wait, I gave you that as a quid pro quo. Tit for tat! Tit for tat! The wounds don't match the knife. The knife that was recovered at the crime scene? Correct. Are you quite sure? The victim suffered eight distinct stab wounds. The weapon was a knife two inches wide as point by eight inches long. This knife couldn't have made those wounds. So Mr. Balfour is lying. Yes, I lied. 
I'm so sorry. Tell me what actually happened, Mr. Balfour. I was in the water closet. That part was true. I heard Irene scream. When I came out, I saw them. He was stabbing her and she was fighting him. She was still alive? Yes. What did you do? Nothing. I couldn't move. I, I swear I wanted to, but I couldn't move. You watched as she was being murdered and you did nothing? You then cut your own arm with an ordinary kitchen knife to bolster your fabricated story of heroics. Yes. I'm a coward. I'm, I'm nothing but a coward. Did the attacker see you? Yes. He looked right at me. I thought I was going to die, but then... He left. The boy seems to be telling the truth now. But why would the killer let him live? Perhaps so he could tell of what happened? To perpetuate the legend of the clown? What are you doing back there? Why can't I come in? It's a surprise. Whoever this clown is, he seems to be motivated by puritanical beliefs. The flyer and the photograph were meant to instill fear and shame. Perhaps the motive for the murder is the same. Well, strong religious convictions can motivate extreme acts. Perhaps he believes he's saving these students from damnation. But to kill? To, to commit such an act of evil himself? It seems irrational to us, yes. But perhaps not to him. Mm -hmm. I'm only glad he wasn't around when I was at school. So what do you think? You're wearing that to the party tonight? Well, yes, I'll wear whatever I please to the party tonight. Well, no, it's, it's just that... To, to... Aren't costumes meant to be frightening? Yes, but frightening costumes are so unattractive. I just... I thought I'd try something more fun. You're a witch. A seductive witch. Now it's time for your costume. <laughs> Don't be afraid. It's not as tight as it looks. Ouch! Lee? Lee, where have you gotten to? Donovan, can you answer it, please? Iverson Residence, Jonathan Kent speaking. Hello? Hello? What in the world? Lee! Where are you? I'll be right there. I eagerly await your return. Good tonight. And you two rarely tell me how good I look. What is this? What do you want? Who are you? It's you. Toronto Constabulary. Miss Cherry. Hello, gentlemen. We received a call about a disturbance. Miss Cherry, might I ask what you're doing here? Don't worry, I didn't touch a thing. After you refused to give me any information about the murder, I decided to revisit my old sources from last year's clown incidents. This young man was one of your sources? No. I believe this is Donovan Kent. He was the sweetheart of the poor girl who killed herself last year. This is her house. She and her sister were two of my sources. So he doesn't live here? No. I don't know why he's here. Is there anyone else in the house? I don't believe so. 
two brandy glasses. George, have a look around. See if anyone left in any sort of hurry. Sir. Miss Cherry, how did you come to be inside? I noticed from the road that the door was ajar. Then I heard someone, a man's voice, say, it's you. As if he recognized the killer? Then I heard a scream. By the time I was inside, the clown was fleeing through the back door. My guess is it's a fellow student, perhaps another member of the lit. Whoever it was seems to have lost a shoe. Hello? Hello? Is there somebody in there? scream. I came in from the kitchen and saw the clown, the knife, the blood. I think Donovan was already dead. What did you do? I ran and I hid in the closet. Were your parents not at home? They're visiting my aunt in St. Catherine's. I'm sorry to bring this up, Miss Iverson, but... Uh... Is this your sister? Heather. Yes. But she took her own life? Last year. I'm so sorry. What happened? That happened. She committed suicide because of the shame that was brought upon her. Who is the boy in the photo? Donovan. The same young man who was killed in your home? Well, yes, but it had nothing to do with Heather. Donovan was so distraught after she... It was our grief that brought us together. You were sweethearts. Could one of your classmates be responsible for this? For killing him? No. You haven't noticed anyone acting strangely at school? I haven't, I haven't noticed anything. But, but the costume, I, I think I've seen the costume before. Where? I believe it was in a school play. Something the matter, Detective? Yes, look at these. The jack-o'-lanterns, they look quite nice. Indeed, precisely. Every melon-fisted constable in this station house has a defter mm -hmm. touch than I. Hmm. I'm afraid it is time for me to bow out of my own contest. A contest? Indeed. Care to participate? Perhaps I'll try my hand. I'm rather good with a knife. Well. The shoe we found at the scene of the second murder is a match for the bloody footprint we found at the scene of the first. Isn't it obvious? It's a killer clown murder. What have you got there, sir? Pumpkin seeds. I've told you, Crabtree, Margaret's been roasting them. The only good thing to come out of this All Hallows nonsense. Now then, my next question is, why were these children all home alone without chaperones? Teeners, sir. What? They are not children, not yet adults. They're teeners. The parents in both of the instances were out of town. We're working on contacting them now. Mm. Any thoughts on as to why they were being targeted? They're a bit fibrous. Eh? The pumpkin seeds are they're a bit fibrous. They could use some flavor. They're salted. That's flavor enough, right, Murdoch? 
The killer seems to be acting on the same puritanical motive that drove him to stalk and photograph this same group of students last year. And now he's graduated to murder. Indeed, although I have no explanation as to why he only killed one of the victims in each of the attacks. One boy and one girl. And nothing that links them to the two that were killed? Not as yet. And all the students were members of the same club? The Lit, sir, an academic society. Well, let's get a list of the membership. And we'll station a constable at the house of anyone we think was up to a little bit of how's your father? So what's on these ones? Well, that's the ruined batch. Margaret was making a pumpkin pie. She spilt spices all over that lot. Ooh, nutmeg. Sir, I think they're fantastic. They're bloody awful is what they are, Crabtree. Now, how do we catch this clown Murdoch? Well, I do have one idea. Miss Iverson gave me the name of a young lady who is the president of the drama club at the school. Perhaps she knows something about this costume. Mm. Thank you, Miss Porter. Head of the drama club, are you? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Miss Porter, did any of your shows employ the use of a clown costume? Uh, yes, we did Pagliacci about two years ago. Oh, where might we find those? I'm not sure, uh, but the costumes from each show should be organized together, and every hanger is labeled. Did you know the deceased, Mr. Kent and Miss Robbins? A little. We were all in the lit together. So you know what happened last fall at Halloween. Did you see the clown? No, I'm not that kind of girl. What kind of girl? The kind of girl the clown would need to be taking pictures of. Meaning you don't spend time with boys? Perhaps with the chaperone, not like those other girls. Do you agree with what the clown did, taking those photos and showing them around? Sure. We all did. And somebody had to do something. Heather Iverson, the girl who killed herself, she was running around with boys like some Jezebel. It's no small wonder she lost all her friends. And what of the boy in the photo, Mr. Kent? Did he receive the same treatment? Well, there were rumors it was him, but nobody cares what boys do. I'm not so sure that's true, Miss Porter. Of course it is, Murdoch. When I was a young man, I got away with bloody murder. Metaphorically, of course. Well, that may be so, sir, but in this case, someone cared enough about what Mr. Kent was up to to kill him. Ah, uh, here we are, Murdoch. Columbana, Tadeo, Pagliacci. Miss Porter, who else has access to this room? The drama teacher, Mr. Douglas. He's the faculty member who presides over the lit. Sir, Mr. Douglas is nowhere to be found. He may be on the run. We don't know that yet, George. Well, sir, we found these. That's the picture from the flyer. And there's more, sir. He has a setup in there, much like you do in your office. With the one red light, but otherwise the room is dark. The... Dark room. That's it. It's him, George. He's the clown. We have to notify the public. I'll get his description out to the inspector and the lads. It seems we'll be working late tonight, George. I'll have to notify Julia that I won't be able to attend the neighbor's fancy costume party. You hardly seem disappointed, sir. I am not. Stay home. Sir, isn't the clown killing people in their homes? Only when the parents are out gallivanting. Yes, well, I think your directive may have been issued too late, Inspector. Hey, We just received a report of a group of youngsters causing a disturbance down on Queen Street. <sighs> Halloween gets worse every year. Get to work on checking those finger marks, Crabtree. When we find Douglas, I want him to swing for this. Sir. <clears throat> well, good night, George. Hey, right, Henry. Happy Halloween. Any plans? I think Ruthie wants to take Jordan to ask for tricks and treats. You? Uh, I'm going to match finger marks on this shoe to those of Mr. Douglas we obtained in his home. Festive. Indeed. Uh, try not to be murdered by a killer clown. Answer that. Am I the only one here? Station house four. Hig Higgins? I know you found that music box. If this is you, I'll. Operator, 
Yes, Operator, this is Station House 4. I have a call on my other telephone. I need you to tell me where it's coming from. I, I beg your pardon? Well, I need to know who's making the other call to the Station House. You would have just connected it. Yes, but what do you mean? Is this some kind of joke? I assure you, ma'am, this is no joke. It's a matter of police urgency. I must know where that call is coming from. Constable, the call is coming from inside the Station House. It's not broken. It's just a little bruised. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure I'm more shaken than hurt. I only hope I never see another clown as long as I live. I can't imagine why the killer would target you, George. Until now, he's been focused on a small group of students. Sir, I haven't the faintest. He still went through the trouble of making the phone call. Just like the other victims. How did you manage to fight him off, George? Well, it was strange. There was a moment he had me flat on my back. I swear he could have killed me, and then he hesitated. He let you live. I think so, sir. It, it was just for a moment, but I took advantage of it. I put a boot into him, and he ran off. Well, if he didn't want to kill you... Sir? There you are. Oh, thank you, Doctor. I'm sorry all of this has interfered with your fancy dress party. Oh. <laughs> George. The shoe. It's gone. Oh, no. That was the only piece of evidence that would tie the killer to the murders. Sir, I found finger marks on the shoe, but I would not yet compared them to Mr. Douglas. He knew you had the evidence to hang him. He came back to steal it. We have to stop him before he strikes again. All right, then, you will clear off home, you bloody crackpot. Let the dog see the rabbit. Uh, Inspector. <laughs> Are you all right? Is this some kind of trick-or-treat prank? No, it's not a damn prank. We're with the police. We're here to help. What happened? I was kidnapped. By whom? Someone dressed as a clown. What's your name, sir? Roger Douglas. Is that right? We've been looking for you, Mr. Douglas. It happened two nights ago. I was home alone, and suddenly I felt like someone was watching me. I heard a sound in the next room, so I went to look, but no one was there. I turned around and... Someone hit you? Knocked me right out. Did you see who it was? I saw the costume, Pagliacci. The clown. Next thing I knew, I was waking up in a room with no windows, tied up. Were you alone? He came to check on me a couple of times, fed me some bread and milk. And you managed to escape? I worked my feet free from the ropes. Uh, I was able to get close enough to the door to kick it open. From there, I went up a few stairs and stumbled out into the street. That's when you found me. Convenient this clown didn't know much about tying ropes. What do you mean? Well, my men found the place that you said you were being held, and there was nothing there. No evidence of another party. Another party? The clown, Douglas. No sign of him. What do you... You think I kidnapped myself? We know that you are the clown, Mr. Douglas. We found these in your home, along with more photos of other students. Yes, I took these. Last year... You dressed up and terrorized the kids. Terrorized? I was warning them. You wouldn't believe the things they do. One of them had to leave school because she was... She had it taken care of. What do you think will happen to her soul? I am doing the work of the Lord. To keep them from a life of sin, you decided they should have no life at all. What? Irene Robbins and Donovan Kent. What about them? They're dead, Mr. Douglas. You donned your clown costume and stabbed them to death. No. No. No, I, I had nothing to do with this. I swear. Don't you see? 
It's whoever kidnapped me. Everything I did, I did out of love for my students. Someone else has the costume. Someone else is doing this. A second clown. Excuse us if we remain skeptical. I swear to you, I, I have no idea what is going on. I did not kill anyone. Detective. Is Detective Murdoch still in? No, Miss Cherry is very busy with the drama teacher fellow and all that nasty killer clown business. Would you like some pie? The drama teacher? Hmm. From Jarvis Collegiate? Hmm. He's the one that oversees the lit. Yes, yes. No, 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 I was not supposed to tell you that. Don't worry about it. Unless you won't print it. Of course I'll print it. Oh. Tiring day, Detective? Mm, something like that. Perhaps this will raise your spirits? My, my. Look at the detail. Uh, he sort of scratched. Oh, is that? A self-portrait, yes. Well, let's leave it with the others, and I'm sure you'll be awarded first prize in the morning. Congratulations, Mrs. Hart. Hmm. Do you believe him? Of course not. He knew we were after him, so he came up with this kidnapping stunt to give himself an alibi. Right after he stole the shoe. The one piece of evidence that could have tied him to at least one of the murders. Sir, I was moments away from confirming the finger marks on the shoe were his. Precisely. Too bloody convenient. So it's your theory against his word? An all too familiar scenario. Miss Porter? Uh, what brings you here? I saw the papers and I got scared. My parents went to visit some friends in Newmarket for a few days and... You've been left home alone? Yes. I'm awfully scared. I can only imagine. You'll be happy to know we have a suspect in custody. Are you sure? How do you know? How do you know who's behind that mask? If it will make you feel better, you could always stay here. In the cells. William! It's the safest place in the city. If you're alone tonight, you're welcome to stay at our house. Thank you. Y yes, I, I, I think that would help. Good. Come. I have half a mind to cook you for dinner. Thank you, I'm all right. Is that him? I thought they caught the murderer. They have the wrong man. Sirs, is Miss Cherry all right? Mrs. Hart happened along and the clown ran off. So this means that Douglas is not the killer. So he really was kidnapped? Presumably to frame him for the murders. So who is it then? And why did they want to kill Miss Cherry? Well, sir, we assumed that the motive was to stop the students from engaging in carnal activity, but that no longer holds. Sir, so what if the motivation wasn't about the carnal activity, but the response to it? The shaming. Andrea Porter did state that Heather Iverson didn't kill herself only because of the clown's photograph. Also because of how a fellow student shamed her for it. Right, and two of our victims are amongst those students, the ones who did the shaming. And perhaps Perry Balfour was left alive because he was new to the school. Whereas Miss Cherry went off and published an article that wasn't so much about the clown, but about the, the promiscuity of the teeners. Teeners? Not you as well, Crabtree. Uh, sir, I'm just trying to keep up with the times. That could be why Miss Cherry was targeted. Perhaps the anonymous tip that she received about the first murder came from the killer himself in order to draw her in. But why would he want to kill you too, Bugloops? But sir, he didn't. He didn't come for me, he came for the shoe. We assume that Mr. Douglas stole the evidence in order to keep us from discovering that he was the killer, when in fact, it was the killer who stole the evidence in order to keep us from discovering that Mr. Douglas was not the killer. All right. So someone's killing everyone who shamed that poor girl. Who is it? And? Who's he gonna go for next? I can't believe this is happening. Why can't those girls just stop fooling around with the boys? You can't.
can't blame your classmates for what's happened, Miss Porter. They're the victims. Well, if they acted like ladies, none of this would be happening. You get what you deserve in this life. Hello? Dr. Hackman? Iverson? You know why I did it. It's obvious, isn't it? Revenge? Yes. For what happened to your sister? For what they did to my sister. It's an unbearable pain to lose someone you love. I didn't do it because of my pain. I did it for her. Her friends turned on her, acted like they never even knew her, like she was worthless. I watched her heart break. And the worst part is, deep down, she thought they were right. And Donovan can't? No one cared what he'd done. Even though he was the one pressuring Heather to he was as cruel as the rest. That's why I pretended to like him. So you could kill him? So I could watch him die. I suppose now we know where she fell off. Little lady like that couldn't possibly fit her costume. Indeed. Everything seems to <laughs> add up. Oh! Pumpkin spice seeds revolting. They're in my tea. I've ruined a good cuppa. I am so glad this day's over. Good evening, gentlemen. Sir. Sir, I have to say I'm looking forward to getting home myself. It's nearly three o'clock in the morning. I've had to make coffee to stay up this late. George, I wonder if you could do me a favor. Could you please escort Mr. Douglas home? His name has made it into the paper, and the news of his exoneration won't be out until morning. Sir, I'll see that he gets home safe. Thank you. Cherry, thank you for coming. I admit a call from you was quite unexpected, Detective, especially this late at night. At any rate, since you yourself nearly became a victim, I thought it only fitting that you break the news. Roger Douglas is innocent. But you found the photos. Last year's clown, and not a killer. It was Lee Iverson. Lee Iverson. Yes, she's confessed. It seems the murders were revenge for the shaming endured by her late sister, which is probably why she sought to kill you. But Constable Crabtree found her inside the house. The Iverson house. Yes, she was hiding in the closet. You saw her run out the back door. She then returned back through the same door after hiding the clown costume, a ruse to present herself as a victim. Detective, I was by the door the entire time. No one came inside. Are you quite sure? There was a murderous clown on the loose. If someone had come in or out of that house, I would have noticed. All I know is that the clown ran out the back door and Lee Iverson was in the house the whole time. Now, Mr. Douglas, you can't leave the city. Charges may be forthcoming. I didn't kill anyone. No, and we apologize for the delay in confirming as much. What I did was right. You took photographs of young couples in intimate embrace. I did it for them. Good night, Mr. Douglas. 
Mr. Douglas? Mr. Douglas? You. It, it can't be. Who are you? What have you done? Heather Iverson. But you killed yourself. God wouldn't take me. So you both did the killing together? Of course. How did you convince everyone you were dead? My parents were as ashamed as everyone else. When that picture started going around, they took me out of school. After I ended up like this, well, their shame only grew. I suppose they thought it would be easier if everyone thought that I didn't exist. They told everyone she was dead. And took her to an asylum where she could rot away for the rest of her life. They said they never wanted to look at her again. They aren't away in St. Catherine's at your aunt's, are they? They planned to. But they didn't make it out of the house. Tell me where we can find their bodies. We'll tell you. But we have one request. Hang us quickly. We'd like to visit them in hell. Well, Mrs. Hart, I think there is little question as to which is the finest jack-o'-lantern. Thank you, Detective. What is my prize? Oh, the best prize of all. The honor and respect of the... Oh, now, hang on a minute. What is this? Ruth, you made Jordan a Halloween costume. Well, she had one made. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hart, but I think we have a new winner. What is going on? Happy Halloween, William. Well, Halloween is over. Yes, but I arranged these lovely costumes for us, and we never got to wear them. So Halloween should last one day longer just for you. That's right. Do you object? Mm. Well, I suppose I don't. Good. Let's stop being such a stick in the mud and try on the costume that I have made for you. Seductive detective. Oh, but doctor, I'm already wearing that costume. <laughs> by the oncoming train. Indeed. Instead of being hit and thrown, she appears to have been run over while laying on the tracks. Suicide, perhaps. One possibility. Doesn't appear to carry any identification. We should get her body off the tracks before the 715. Gentlemen. Seems your suicide might not be a suicide after all. What are we looking at? Limestone. Typical of macadam paving material. I saw no macadam at the railroad tracks. Someone must have moved her body. It was likely she was already dead when the train cut her in half. Excellent work, Mrs. Hart. We eagerly await your post-mortem results. Mrs. Hart, where do you buy your hats? Hats? Well, according to my wife, Violet Hart wears the most exquisite hats. Oh. Well, tell your wife I'm very flattered. I get them made at Miss Driscoll's millinery on Queen. Ah, thank you. Margaret's been in the doldrums recently. Mm. I think a jaunty new titfer might put the spring back in her step. Titfer. Tit for tat. Ha! Good day, <laughs> Mrs. Hart. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what is it you're looking for? A map. Oh, well, you've got plenty of them there. I'm looking for a specific map. Here it is. The planning map of Toronto. It indicates which paving material is used on each of the city's streets. Macadam is green. The deceased's body was found on the tracks here. And the nearest stretch of Macadam? Here.
Her name was Jennifer Drask. We were in the process of notifying the authorities of her disappearance. A sad end to a wretched life. What was her crime? Extortion, larceny. Miss Drask had a knack for relieving people of their money. And her record as an inmate? Exemplary. Now, as you know, we seek to rehabilitate, not punish. Miss Drask was intent on bettering herself. That's why her escape comes as such a surprise. I don't think it was an escape. I believe Miss Drask was murdered and her body was moved to the tracks. Murdered? Good Lord. I'll need to familiarize myself with the facility. Uh, Head Matron Klotz will show you around. The pantry, where we store and prepare food. It's the laundry, where we teach how to wash clothes. The Mercer philosophy is redemption through domestic service. Do any of your wards reject this brand of redemption? Yes, but not Jennifer. She was obedient and docile, a favorite among the matrons. And what of the inmates? They were cruel to her. Just last week, she was viciously assaulted. Miss Klotz, who is this man? Detective William Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. And you are? Dr. Elmira Cotton, head physician. I'm investigating the death of... Poor Jennifer. I heard. It's terribly sad. She was one of your patients? These women are all my patients. This isn't work for me, detective. It's a calling, one to which I must now return. Uh, Dr. Cotton, I'll need to see the clinical file on the deceased. Nurse Adelina, pull the file. Yes, Dr. Cotton. You will receive the file on your way out. Goodbye. The sewing room. <clears throat> Are all of the windows here at the reformatory barred? Yes. Right then. I'll need to see the roof. The roof? Inmates don't have access to the roof. Miss Klotz. Who smokes these cigarettes? All the inmates smoke those. Attention, everyone. I'm Detective William Murdoch of the Toronto Constabulary. I'm investigating the murder of one of your fellow inmates, Miss Jennifer Drask. We got no snitches here, Detective. We least not now that Jennifer's gone. Miss Dose. I beg your pardon? Beg all you want. I got nothing more to say to you, nor do the others. Have you made an arrest in the case? Unfortunately, not yet. Hmm. It's a match. It would seem Miss Drask did indeed fall from the roof. Fall? Likely not of her own volition. What's this? May I use a scalpel? engagement ring. It's engraved with the letters E. 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 
key. We do have an Edna Emerson in our care. What led to her conviction? Her father brought her before the judge because she was pregnant and unmarried. She was sent here for being incorrigible and, oh dear, her stillborn child was delivered here in the reformatory. Oh, um, I'd like to speak with this Miss Emerson, please. Yeah. It has your initials on it. I'm not the only EE -E in the world. Anyways, we're not allowed to have jewelry in here. This ring isn't mine. You're quite sure? I would certainly know if I had been engaged, wouldn't I? I, I came as soon as I heard. What's this about? This is about you, my darling. I bought you a gift. Why? Because I love you. Go on. Oh. You bought me another hat. I did. But not that hat. You bought me a hat, but not this hat? Exactly. But if you take that hat to this shop, then you can exchange it for any other hat you like. I arranged it myself. Really? I've also arranged dinner reservations at that fancy French place that you like. Hmm. So go and pick yourself something nice, and we'll show it off all over town. Thank you, Thomas. Have you had to set foot in the Plaza Theater? It's supposedly quite the marvel. Seats 900 spectators. 900, eh? The current show sounds promising. Quebec's queen of vaudeville, Eva Tongue. <laughs> Jack? Uh, can we turn down this way instead? I, I spotted Clara's cousin over there. I'd like to avoid her. Uh, also on the bill is Long Tack Sam, a magician whose performance is said to enchant. <laughs> I could use a bit of enchantment, couldn't you? I, I just can't stop wondering how many of those 900 people would tell Claire that they've seen us together. I owe it to her not to incite gossip. Plus, uh, she finds vaudeville crude. No, let's not invite her. Be kind, Llewellyn. My marriage helps shield you and I from scrutiny. A flimsy shield if I can ever be seen with you, Jack. Ah, what? Well, perfect timing. Uh, this is... What's your name again, sir? Milo Strange. Detective Llewellyn Watts? Charmed. Uh, what is this regarding? Walt Whitman has been abducted. Uh, Walt Whitman is dead. Don't say that. Walt Whitman, the poet? Walt Whitman, the peacock. Someone has absconded with him. I'll leave you to it then. But it's a bit of a head scratcher, but I'm sure you'll crack it, Watts. You're smirking. I assure you... It's fine. I understand. Mockery is a defense deployed when a person is confronted by nonconformity. I'm sure you're familiar with the experience. Nice jacket. Hmm? Oh. Will you help me? Oh. Thank you for breakfast, Julia. What a surprise. It's nice to have the time. The perks of being unemployed. Indeed. No, one thing is certain. The inmates at that reformatory will not speak with me. I've heard the reformatory is a dreadful institution. The Mercer claims to provide the inmates with the skills required to integrate into the general populace. Yes, but most of those women have been imprisoned for such atrocities as disobeying their parents and fornication or socializing with other races, all things that men can do with impunity. I'm not surprised they won't confide in a man with a badge. Any idea how I could go about getting them to trust me? I suppose you could plant an investigator amongst the prisoners, someone that the women would trust and confide in. Intriguing proposal. I wonder who I could get to do that. Maggie Muldoon.
You have been sentenced to the Andrew Mercer Reformatory for an indeterminate period. Welcome, Dr. Ogden. So what am I being convicted of? Or rather, what am I in for? It seems you are a pickpocket. Oh, marvelous. <laughs> No talking amongst inmates. This is not a social club. <laughs> Stop it! No talking in the halls, Miss Muldoon. <laughs> What you maybe do? Silence! What is going on here? New girl has no respect. Slopping her filth all over. You pushed me! You must like it in the hole, Queenie Dowson. I lie there dreaming of you, Helga. Guard! Take Miss Dowson to the basement. Don't trust this one girl. She's hiding something. She really did push me. No one likes a snitch, Muldoon. Go fetch a mop. Move! How you sew the hem correctly. See the stitches? Evenly spaced and in a straight line. Fine work, Edna. Thank you, Miss Klotz. And this is how you sew the hem incorrectly. See the blood, the mess. I don't even know what to call this if blasphemy was a textile. I'm so sorry, Miss Klotz. I wish I had Edna's talent. Perhaps she could show me what I'm doing wrong. Lead on the cloth again, and you'll be scrubbing floors. Edna, show her how to sew the hem. Thank you. <clears throat> so how do you, how do you? Oh. Oh, you make it look so easy. Thank you. I, I, I'm Maggie. Queenie's gonna kill you when she gets out of the hole. This is where I saw him last, scratching under the lilac. Uh, why Walt Whitman? We share the same vocation, as well as the same inclinations. You're a poet? And I, too, celebrate myself and sing myself. And what I assume, you shall assume? For every atom belonging to me, as, as good, good belongs to you. you. Whitman was a bit of a peacock himself, don't you agree? Strange! Where oh. are you? Who's that? A brute whose soul contains not one iota of peacock. My neighbor, Burl Slag. I heard you've been making accusations. Where is he, Burl? I didn't take your dang bird, you nimini-pimini fop. It had to be you. You hate Walt Whitman. You've made that clear. Uh, is that true? Sure. I hate him. Drives me mad with his infernal squawking. You see, what kind of monster hates birdsong? Hmm. Who's your little friend, Strange? Oh. Uh, the thing is, Detective, it ain't birdsong. It's more like... Squaw! 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 Excuse me, this is a criminal investigation. You'd do well to take it seriously. What makes you think someone would take it? Well, any bird brain can see... This latch don't hold. I'm making no headway with Edna Emerson, or the other inmates, for that matter. You need to make them believe you were one of them. I agree, but how? Punch someone? <laughs> William, I would prefer a less violent approach. What if Maggie Muldoon were to bring in contraband? Edna, want to burn her? Put the 
fabric down, Muldoon. I'm taking you off sewing duty. Come. Try not to burn yourself. Get tangled up with that one, Muldoon. Queenie Dowson here spends most of her days in the hole. Shivering in the dark like the vermin she is. Not a word! Or I'll send you right back down there. It's no wonder your family had you locked up. You are wretched and shameless. Unworthy, unloved, and undeserving of anything. You. Sorry, I think it slipped out of my hand. Next time, you get ten of those. Back to work! Winifred? Has anyone seen Winifred Sanders? Hold. There you are. Winnie, Dr. Cotton will see you now. I don't wish to go, Nurse Adelina. Please. You can discuss it with the doctor. You know she'll turn a deaf ear. What's this about? I don't want to see the doctor. Not this again. Guard. Take her to surgery. Where is he taking her? She's getting snipped. Snipped? Yeah, it's the doc's specialty. She says it stops incorrigibles from breeding. That's barbaric. The girl who died, did she get snipped? Jennifer? Yeah, but she didn't seem to mind. And how did Jennifer get your ring? Who told you? Uh, you know how people gossip. Mm -hmm. Jennifer was my friend. And when I ended things with Leon, I gave the ring to her. Too many memories. I'm sorry. Leon's an Indian. Being with him is what got me sent here in the first place. Mixing races and all. I had to end it. Move! Ah, Mrs. Hart. Thank you for the recommendation. So, how's the post-mortem going? It's been challenging. The trauma to her body complicates the process tremendously. Understood. What have you found so far? She was a robust woman of 32. The injuries from the train occurred after Miss Trask had already died. She was killed by the fall. As we expected. She also has a relatively new surgical scar. Her file from the Mercer mentions she had a tubal ligation while at the reformatory. Anything else? Yes. There was an injection administered here shortly before her death. The toxicology analysis shows she was heavily sedated. So she was drugged before she fell off the roof. Come look. Nice view, huh? The fresh air is just... How'd you get the door open? One of the girls stole the key from a guard and passed it around. Up here, you can almost pretend you're free. Is this where that girl fell? Jennifer? Yeah, probably. I say good riddance. She was a snitch and a teacher's pet. Everyone hated her. Edna said they were friends. Some friend. Should have heard Jennifer taunting Edna about the baby she lost. Edna was crying, and Jennifer wouldn't stop. So I socked her in the teeth. What was that? The day before she died. I was locked up in the hole when Jennifer went off the roof. I asked Edna about it. She said, Jennifer got what she had coming. silence while we perform inspections. Exit your cells. Quickly now.
So the toxicology report found sedatives. And yet none were recorded in Ms. Drask's medical file. Well, apparently the other inmates despised her. And perhaps one of them obtained the drugs. I could try to search the doctor's office. Also, I found a love letter from Edna's ex-fiancé, Leon Redbird. She told me they'd broken up, but the letter says otherwise. If Miss Emerson pushed Miss Drask off the roof, then I suppose Mr. Redbird could have moved her body to the tracks. Leon Redbird. Yes? May I have a word? Detective William Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. I understand you know Miss Edna Emerson. What happened? Is she okay? Oh, Miss Emerson is fine. I'm actually investigating the death of another inmate, Miss Jennifer Drask. Read the name in the papers. No, never met her. It's a sad story. Mr. Redbird? Uh, you know, I worry about Edna in that awful place. Ah, yes. My sympathies. However, I must ask, where were you two nights ago? Two nights ago. I pulled in overnight, unloading a truckload of cabbages. Can anyone confirm this? Uh, the driver. Uh, he'll vouch for me. Yeah? Me. Thank you. A missing bird is not police business. But the law can't help you, Mr. Strange. But certainly someone would have noticed a peacock wandering the streets of Toronto. I am positive he's been stolen. Who on God's green earth would want to steal a peacock? The bloody bird likely just flew away. And landed on your wife's head? You don't like it? It's exquisite. I was on the brink of concluding my report, and I found something quite unusual. What is it? Although Miss Drask had a sterilization scar, she had not, in fact, been sterilized. A surgical scar, but no surgery. Are you quite sure? Yes. Her reproductive organs are completely intact. Then why the scar? That's your domain. Put your back into it, Muldoon. Edna Emerson, I am thoroughly disappointed in you. No, no, please, please don't put me in the hole. Please don't put me in the hole. You keep scrubbing till we come back. Just... came to look for you, but the door was open. Lies. You're trying to steal from me. No. But I am curious why you're hiding all this money in your office. That is none of your concern. Will not be questioned by an incorrigible. You have no idea who I am. Your impertinence is unacceptable. Nurse, sedate this patient. You will not. Matron Klotz, restrain her. <clears throat> Touch me. You're nothing but an insolent wastrel. I'm a surgeon. And a better one than you, I'd wager. Surgeon. This one can't hem a tablecloth, let alone sew up a wound. She is clearly delusional. Step one, gather your materials. I prefer Holbein superfine needles, threaded with cat gut. The same kind you use, Dr. Cotton. Quiet, Adelina. Step two, sterilize your materials. I hear you're a huge sterilization enthusiast, doctor. Miss Muldoon, you are being disruptive. My name is Dr. Julia Ogden, and you're damn right I am. Nurse Adelina, give her the injection. No, call the warden. He'll tell you. Give her the shot. No! I'm sorry.
send the bill to my parents. Of course, Miss Bowden. Is this your handiwork? Oh, it certainly is. A beauty, isn't she? Mm. I call her the Penelope. You should call her the Walt Whitman. Come again. He knows his name. How did you procure this peacock? I bought it off a street urchin. He claimed he had caught it in the wild. Are you suggesting that peacocks are native to Ontario? I'm suggesting I bought it fair and square. Oh, come now, it's even wearing the silver ankle band upon which Mr. Strange inscribed its name. I don't care if he dressed it in a ball gown and called it Aunt Sally. It's mine now. I paid three dollars for it. Regardless of how it came into your possession, this peacock clearly belongs to Mr. Strange. It's all right, detective. I believe this nice woman's story. And vengeance is not an instinct I incline to indulge. Tell you what. Make me one of your gorgeous hats using Whitman's feathers. Name your price. Add on the amount you paid the child, I'll buy it. But whatever you do, I'm taking my peacock home. I'm so sorry. I don't agree with throwing women in the hole. There are a lot of things about this place I don't agree with. Is it true? You're a doctor? Yes. I'm secretly investigating the reformatory. Really? It's about time someone exposed the conditions here. Thank you for doing this. Well, yes. I think I've gathered enough evidence to finish my report. Do you think you could get me out of here? Follow me. You don't have an appointment with the warden. The warden has accepted unscheduled visits in the past. It should be no different on this occasion. Well, then, it's a shame the warden isn't here on this occasion. Where might the warden be? Attending a family function in Kingston. I am here on official police business. I need to question one of your inmates, a Maggie Muldoon. That one. Always trouble. You cannot see her. She is undergoing corrective therapy. I beg your pardon? She's being disciplined. Sir! I warned you. Julia? Julia? Julia! William. Thank you, Adelina. Oh, thank God. Are you all right? I'm fine, William, but I do believe I'm ready to be sprung from this place. What have you found out? Edna Emerson could not have drugged Jennifer. The, the supplies are too well secured. Well, then who? Dr. Cotton is acting very suspiciously. She has a stack of money hidden in her office, which she most adamantly does not wish to discuss. And when I confronted her on it, she, she drugged me and put me in the hole. I am appalled that you're taking the word of this reprobate over. It's in the drawer. This reprobate is working with the Toronto Constabulary. That money has nothing to do with your investigation. Did Jennifer Drask bribe you to stop the operation? What? Jennifer Drask's file indicates you performed a sterilization procedure. Yet, in our post-mortem, we found no evidence of such a surgery. Did she threaten to expose you? Is that why you killed her? That's nonsense. You gave Jennifer Drask a fake scar in order to hide your corruption. I'm sure Warden Burke will be very interested in your creative attention to detail. All right. I took her money, but I didn't kill Jennifer Drask. The night she died, I was dining at Chez Pierre. Even if that is true, you'll still be fired. For what? I was just doing my job. You were sterilizing women against their will. As mandated by the Mercer Reformatory, an institution that values my vision and expertise. And what exactly is your vision? A society unburdened by the morally unfit. And not stand idly by while habitual criminals pollute our world with their offspring. I agree. The woman's philosophies are despicable. The entire system is despicable. The entire system can wait. Because right now, I just need you to solve this particular murder. Well, how could Jennifer have smuggled in this money to pay off the doctor? Of 
Cork down provisions. Looks like you're going shopping, me old mucker. Mr. Redbird. <laughs> Mr. Redbird, stop. Turn around. Please. Don't take him away. You didn't tell me your and Edna's son survived. Well, you didn't ask. So it's not exactly a lie. But I did lie about Jennifer Drask. So you knew her? She was blackmailing Edna. She said, if Children's Aid found out that our son was alive, they take him away. So you paid her? What would you do if it was your boy? First, Jennifer took Edna's ring. Then she took all the money we had. We gave her everything to protect Charlie, but we had nothing to do with her death. You check my alibi. Please, just let me take my son home. Thank you for your time, Mr. Redbird. Mm -hmm. We'll contact you if we have any further questions. All right. Come on, Charlie. Let's go. So the money Jennifer Drask used to bribe Dr. Cotton was in fact Leon Redbird's savings. Miss Drask had been blackmailing Edna Emerson by threatening to expose the fact that her son had survived. Blackmail gives Emerson a motive to kill Drask. But Edna didn't have access to the syringe or the sedatives that were found in Jennifer's system. Nor could she have carried the body to the tracks. And Leon Redbird had an alibi, so he couldn't have done it either. I'm just stunned that Edna managed to smuggle her baby out of that dungeon. She must have had help. Anyone who helped her could be another potential target of Jennifer Drask's extortion. Someone had to have signed the baby's death certificate. Let's have a look at Edna's medical file. And here it is. Stillbirth. Signed by Adelina D. Martino. The nurse. You see how happy he is. Uh, how does one determine whether a peacock is happy? By his strut. <laughs> so I suppose our adventure ends here. Oh, it doesn't have to. I hope you will attend. Hmm. Huh. Thank you for taking me seriously, Detective Watts. And thank you for granting me a reprieve from seriousness, Mr. Strange. Oh. Fix your latch. Uh. All right. I can't find Adelina anywhere. I have looked upstairs, downstairs, the, the kitchen, the sewing room, the laundry. I, I have searched absolutely everywhere. Julia? The roof. Adelina! Miss Martino, step away from the edge. It's all my fault, you know. The death of Miss Drask. She fell right here. I heard her head hit the ground. Crack! I still hear it over and over. If Jennifer fell, it is not your fault. Yes, it is. She wanted money to keep quiet about Edna's baby. We came here to talk. She started yelling her demands, and I gave her a shot to calm her down. She lost her balance. She fell right here. I heard her head hit the ground. Crack! Please, Adelina, just take one step down. This place is evil, and nobody cares. I care. And I'll do everything in my power to see that you receive the most lenient sentence possible. Everything in your power. What power do you have? Not as much as I'd like sometimes. But 
Please, Adelina. I do believe that women can change the world. But first we have to start trusting each other. Please. I just wanted to help those women. You did. With every small gesture of compassion you offered them. I wanted to show you something. I recruited a lawyer friend of mine. We lodged an emergency petition. With my testimony, we believe we can secure Edna's release and have her reunited with her family. Maybe you do really have power. It's not just my doing. You helped to keep that family together. <clears throat> I suppose I'm going to jail now. Thank you, Dr. Ogden. But what about the others? Who will speak for all the other incorrigible women? It's a small gathering, informal, and it sounds like a lot of fun. You remember fun, don't you? I can't. I have family obligations. You're a married man, Jack. You will always have family obligations. I'm just asking for two hours with you. I'm sorry. I'm late. Claire has made a pot roast. You'd choose boiled cow flesh over me? Thomas? Oh, you look beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. You've had your coat cleaned. Well, I look the bee's knees for my best girl. <laughs> I know what you're doing, Thomas. You don't have to fuss over me. Anything I can do to put a smile on my wife's face is no fuss at all. Every hour of every day, I'm driven mad by the thought. Where's our son? Where's Bobby? What have the men you've hired been telling you? They found him in Winnipeg. What? Bobby's in Winnipeg? He was. He got wind that I was looking for him. He ran off again. Why did he run? Margaret. Bobby's life is his own, too. Salvage or destroy. There's nothing we can do about it. We can help him. No, we can't. Not unless he wants it. No. <laughs> it, it's the truth. I'm so sorry, Margaret. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. May this night transport us from this coarse and weary world and show us a place where we are limitless. My name is Milo Strange. Yeah. 
No. <gasps> Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. It's simply terrible. You are the lady of the house? Yes, Deborah Anderson. Uh, I was the one who telephoned. We were having a party for my husband when one of the guests, our neighbor, walked in here and saw this. Afternoon, gentlemen. It, it was my wife who found him. Isn't that right, Sue? Yes. What did you see, Mrs... Uh, Billingsley. He was dead. Just lying there, just like that. You didn't see what happened? Did anyone see what happened? We didn't see a thing. I didn't even arrive until after it happened. Ah, an army man. Yes, sir. Your undershirt's showing. Very sloppy. A soldier is only as fine as his uniform. Keep an eye on that, son. Mm -hmm. Who was the deceased, I guess? Uh, yes, Mr. Albert Waxworthy, a bachelor, so he came alone, of course. He works for my husband, Lyle Anderson, of Anderson Insurance. And where is your husband? Honey, here he is. Terrible. Terrible. Terrible business, I know, gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Lyle Anderson. And you are? Why did it have to be you two? What the bloody hell's going on, Myers? Who is Lyle Anderson? I am Lyle Anderson. Terence Myers is my spy name. You've unfortunately stumbled into my civilian life. Well, who's the dead man? Waxworthy. He worked for me. As a spy? No, as an insurance salesman. You actually own an insurance company? Yes, I do. Anderson Insurance. I, I think Margaret bought an annuity from you. And that is a fine investment, Tom. Ah. <laughs> so that's really your wife? And, and those are your children? Yes, they are. Who killed Waxworthy, then? I have no idea. Well, must have been a spy. Certainly not. I am exceedingly cautious. Nobody that knows Terence Myers knows about Lyle Anderson. And nobody that knows Anderson knows about Myers. Mrs. Hart is on her way here now. No. Call her off. Someone needs to examine the body. Your wife, then. She can be trusted. If no one in this house knows you're a spy, then why is there a man lying on your living room floor with a knife stuck in his back? People kill for all kinds of reasons, Tom. But this, most certainly, is not a matter of national security. Oh, uh, I know it's not an appropriate time for cake, but we have to eat something, and uh, I'm hardly able to cook. Leave it on the table for me, will you please, dear? Junior, what did I tell you about touching my train set? <laughs> I didn't even do anything. You were such a stick in the mud, you know that? You're getting that haircut, young man. Yes, sir. Right then. We need to know where everyone was the moment that Mr. Waxworthy's body was found. Uh, well, we were all over the place, weren't we, dear? I'm afraid so. We were playing cats and dogs. Cats and dogs? It's a parlor game, Murdoch. Margaret loves to play it all the time. You hide playing cards all around the house. One team searches for red cards, the other for black. Mm. Two cards per player. Uh, my husband and I were team captains, so we hit the cards. You search all over, and when you find one, you bark or meow, depending on what team you're on. The last time I saw Mr. Waxworthy was in the back garden. You were searching for cards in the back garden? You're permitted to hide them anywhere. I was in the kitchen and could hear them through the window. I overheard them talking about birds. Mm -hmm. We spotted some lovely warblers. I was in the garden as well. Uh, Waxworthy went inside, but Deborah and I remained. That was only a minute or two before I came in here and saw him. We need to track all of the guests' movements. We should interview them separately. Right. Do you want the cats or the dogs? Hello, youths. You want to speak with the detective? We'd like to report a missing person, Coach Keen. What did he coach? Basketball with the Carlton Street Stallions. And when did you see him last? Two hours ago. He was meant to be back in 30 minutes. We found this in the alley. It's his hat. Looks like blood. 
Where was he off to? He was just going down the street to buy uniforms. We all chipped in and gave him seven dollars. You paid for them yourselves? Yeah, we have money. You can't prove we stole it. Oh. Yeah, right. So this Coach Keen went off to buy uniforms and then never came back? Is there anything you can tell us about him? He's short. Mm. And dirty. And he has a mustache. An ugly one. Mm. How long have you lads known this chap? Since yesterday. You need an adult to sign up for the basketball league, so we saw one and we asked him. Right, well, we'll... We'll see what we can do, lads. Hello? Oh. Ah, Julia, thank you for coming. Well, it's a treat to get out of the house. But why did you need me here instead of... Miss it's a bit of a delicate situation, actually. Dr. Julia Ogden, allow me to introduce you to Lyle Anderson. <laughs> Lyle Anderson? You're Lyle Anderson, are you? Yes, I am. Oh. Of course you are. I believe what Julia is trying to say is that she recognizes your name from purchasing your insurance oh, products. I see, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's right. Anderson Insurance. Well, why don't I get down to work? <laughs> Strange people. All right, then. Mrs. Anderson stated that the murder weapon came from the kitchen. Did anyone report being in there? I was there earlier in the afternoon. And your wife after that? Everyone was in there at some point. Well, whoever it was, the circumstances of this suggest that it was premeditated. Did anyone you spoke with suggest a reason why someone would want to kill Mr. Waxworthy? No one. Everyone loved the old fellow. Same with everyone I spoke to. Something isn't right. It's just a bloody sketch. Okay, here we go. Your daughter was in the cloakroom. Bud Kitterman had not yet arrived. Junior was upstairs. Mrs. Anderson was in the garden with Mr. Billingsley. And I was here, coming out of the water closet. Mrs. Billingsley discovered Mr. Waxworthy's body in the living room. Now, if we assume that Mr. Waxworthy was killed moments before his body was discovered, the only person who could have slipped into the living room unseen was your daughter, Lorraine Anderson. I was in the kitchen when I heard Mrs. Billingsley scream. Where were you right before that? Um, I was in the cloakroom searching for playing cards. I'd been there maybe a few minutes. So a few minutes before the body was found, you'd also been in the living room. Was anyone there? No one. Mr. Waxworthy had not yet entered the room. So, while you were in the cloakroom, did you hear anything happening in the living room? I heard someone whistling. Birdsong. Waxworthy was discussing warblers in the garden. Then the whistling stopped and there was a sound. What sound, honey? It was a sort of clunk. A clunk. Can you elaborate? I don't know how to describe it. it. It was a clunk. A minute or so later, I came out of the cloakroom. Waxworthy must have been there. No, no, the living room was empty. It was dark because the drapes were drawn, but I'm sure Mr. Waxworthy was not there. The drapes were drawn? Yes. Why? Come on now, detective. Cats and dogs is all the more fun in the dark. It is, actually. Our coach never made it to pick up the uniforms. Are you sure? Somewhere between that alley and here is where he... Well, where something happened. Well, maybe there was an accident. He saved somebody's life. I mean, that would explain the blood. Or maybe uh, he fell into the sewer and was sucked into the deep by the creatures that dwell therein. What? Hmm. Yes. Yes, what? I agree with you. Agree with what? What? What's that? Uniforms. The envelope the money was in, perhaps. There was blood on it. Uh-huh. Well, he was stabbed, clearly. Large kitchen knife buried five inches into his back. 
It's been wiped clean. I doubt very much I'll be able to obtain finger marks. Also, it seems the body was moved. Ah, the bunched up sweater. Yes, he seems to have been dragged by his feet. If he was dragged in a straight line, then he may have been killed by this bookcase, but no sign of anything. Perhaps he was dragged in from another room? Or the killer began dragging the body, but was interrupted. We've been unable to determine motive for anyone wanting to kill Mr. Waxworthy. Perhaps this is a case of mistaken identity. And who was he mistaken for? Similar sweater. Same build, same hair. I find it far more likely that someone would want to kill a secret agent over an insurance salesman. Oh, I don't know about that, man. They're all smarmy buggers. Mr. Anderson, do not eat that. What? Why? Look, discoloration where it was touching the cake, oxidization. If it's aluminum... Then it could be reacting to lie. Mr. Anderson, I believe someone may be trying to kill you. I hate to say it, but if someone is trying to kill you, Murdoch, I can assure you this is not a matter of national security. Nobody in this house knows of the existence of Terence Myers. Maybe one of your friends isn't such a friend after all. I've known my wife for 18 years. I've watched both of my children being born. The Billingsleys have been our neighbors for over a decade. None of them, I assure you, none of them suspect a thing. What of your daughter's escort? Bud. Kitterman. I don't like him. I don't trust him. He's no good. But I have scrutinized his parents, his grandparents, and every single one of his relatives living and dead. Murdoch, I've been in his bedroom when he's asleep at night. He's a sorry excuse for a man, but he's no spy. So you think someone is trying to kill Lyle Anderson, not Terence Myers? So it would seem. Why would anyone want to do that? I haven't the foggiest. You moved the body. To the spare bedroom. Quite the heavy chap. What have you learned? The rest of the cake isn't reacting to aluminum, and no one got sick. I believe Mr. Anderson's piece of cake was the only one poisoned. And the lie? Mrs. Anderson keeps them under the sink. His piece of cake was left out on the table for at least 15 minutes. Meaning anyone could have accessed the lie in the kitchen and sprinkled some on his piece of cake. True. But his wife's the one who served it to him. You think I tried to kill my own husband? You were the one who served him a poisoned slice of cake. But why would I do such an awful thing? I couldn't wish for a better husband. Lyle is, is truly a good and honest man. Well, that doesn't mean you didn't want to kill him. Wives kill their husbands for all kinds of reasons. Infidelity, bankruptcy, drunkenness, slovenliness, a cold demeanor. <clears throat> what of the other guests? Do you know of any reason why any of them would wish your husband harm? No. <sighs> Mrs. Anderson, someone has tried to kill him and may try to do so again. Please, if you know something, tell us. He wouldn't have done anything, not really. Who? Just tell them. Lorraine. Well, shh. Tell us what. Don't mind her, she gets ideas in her head. In my head, he's the one with the ideas. Lorraine! Mrs. Sanderson, please. What are these? Proof. Junior's been wanting to kill Dad for years. I didn't do it. These drawings of yours certainly suggest you wanted to kill him. And those are just for fun. Your father's been ripped apart by lions. That's fun. <laughs> yes. You're being accused of murder, son. You stated that you went upstairs to your room shortly after dogs and cats began. Well, I found a couple of cards and quit. I hate that stupid game. And you didn't come out of your room until you heard Mrs. Billingsley scream. I was up there the whole time. We'll ask everyone if they saw you. Are you sure? Why would I kill him anyways, hmm? 
Why would I stab a man in the living room of a crowded party when I could just as easily go upstairs while he's asleep, smother him with a pillow, grab the bag that I backed in advance, walk 15 minutes to the train station, take the Midnight Express to Pennsylvania before dawn? Hmm? I'll ask the other guests, but I tend to believe him. Aren't you going to ask me who did it? Did what? Tried to kill my father. It's obvious, isn't it? Bud came from out of town to visit Dad. He wanted to ask Lorraine to marry him. Dad said no. Mr. Kitterman had not yet arrived. I wouldn't be so sure, Maddock. I think he had. My guess would be whoever bloodied the hat stole the money. Perhaps someone saw something. You there. Have you been here long? All afternoon. Why? We're looking for a chap by the name of Keane, a basketball coach. Oh, yeah, I know him. Really? Sure, I play basketballs every Saturday. You do? Well, when I'm not mountain climbing. Yeah, uh, very funny. Look, we think this chap may have been injured in the vicinity over the last couple of hours. He's described as short, dirty, mustached, and in possession of $7. Describes half the drunks in this town, except for the $7 part. Drunks. Oh, no. When did you arrive at the party this afternoon, Kitterman? Just after the murder. I heard Miss Billingsley scream as I came up the front walk. Are you sure about that, son? Yes, of course. You're looking very smart. I am an army man, sir. <laughs> when we arrived, your undershirt was showing and your collar was unbuttoned. I fixed it for you. There was something on your undershirt. Pull your shirt out. What is that? Is that blood? Lipstick. What? You, you were wearing lipstick? There is only one explanation, Mr. Kitterman. You lied to us. You were here. You were kissing Miss Anderson in the cloakroom just before the murder. It's true. It's all true. I lied about when I arrived at the party, but I didn't kill anyone. What time did you get here? Around 2.30. It was probably 15 minutes before the scream. What happened when you came inside? It was dark. The only person in the living room was Lorraine. She said that she wanted to show me something, and, well, we went into the cloakroom. So no one else saw you come inside? No, that's why we thought we could have some time alone to... Do what, son? Hmm? What were you doing with my daughter? Kissing. <clears throat> and, and when did you come out of the cloakroom? A few minutes later. Waxworthy? We heard him whistling, but he wasn't there. No dead body? No, I swear, everything was normal. I went back out the front door so I could pretend to arrive so Mr. Anderson wouldn't know that I'd been alone with Lorraine. You little snake. You were there, hmm? You killed Wasworthy because you thought you were killing me. Mr. Anderson, should we get some fresh air? Well, that boy's life was worth next to nothing. He seems like a thoroughly decent chap. Not good enough for my daughter. Well, regardless of his character, the sequence of events doesn't make sense. He would have to have gone straight from kissing young Miss Anderson to locating Mr. Waxworthy, stabbing him, then dragging his body to the middle of the living room for no apparent reason, and... And going about his day as if nothing had happened. Yeah, you're right. The boy doesn't have a backbone to murder anybody. He is an army man. He enlisted last week. Uh, sir, perhaps we ought to speak with the person who discovered the body. Mrs. Billingsley, before you found Mr. Waxworthy in the living room, are, are you sure you saw no one else there? Positively. And Mr. Waxworthy was dead? Yes, of course. Where did you enter from? The back door there. I went through the kitchen and into the living room. And did you see anyone else along the way? No. Yes. 
Lorraine was coming past me out to the garden. Then where was Bloody Waxworthy? Two people said the living room was empty. And less than a minute later, you found him dead. Now, that doesn't really add up, does it? Easy now. My wife did nothing wrong. How can you be so sure? You were sitting out here the whole time. My wife is not a murderer, sir. How dare you? I dare, because she's the only one who could have done it. Isn't that right, Meadow? Meadow? Sir, the wall. There's something not quite right about it. Another round. Uh, I'm afraid not, Barkeep. Mr. Keen here has just run out of money. What a tarnation. What are you doing in here? Those kids are waiting on their uniforms. What kids? What are uniforms? The uniforms this money was meant to buy. They trusted you. They just wanted to play basketball. They're street rats. Barkeep! Another round. We thought you'd been attacked. I was. <laughs> Being him for that is since we was kids. <laughs> All right, you stop it. I've got half a mind to arrest you. Now, where's the rest of the seven dollars? You're holding it. Mm. He's not worth the hot meal. With me, Constable. The study ends at this wall. The kitchen only extends to that one. The exterior of the house is continuous. What are you saying? There is something behind this bookcase. You think there's something hidden there? Darling, would you please go look in on the children? I I'd like to have a word with the detective alone. Whatever for? Oh, I shouldn't want to worry you with it, dear. <laughs> of course, sweetheart. Time to come clean, Lyle. You may never speak a word of this. Ready? For what? The birds of America. secret hidden lair in your home? Yeah. I use it to become Terrence Myers. I can sneak in here without my family noticing. What in the world? Why did you not tell us about this? Because there was no need to. It has nothing to do with the murder. Mr. Waxworthy's body was dragged to the middle of the living room, likely from the direction of this very bookcase. It's highly probable that he was murdered here and then dragged. It's not even remotely probable. Nobody, but nobody, knows of the existence of this room. How can you be so sure? Because my entire career, my entire life depends on... No. Mr. Myers? No. What is it? No, it can't be. What is that? This is a paradox machine. I use it to send and receive coded messages. Well, whatever it is, what's the problem? Problem. Every afternoon, I come in here to check for unread messages. This afternoon, I had not yet done so because of the murder. So what? This machine was recently outfitted with a new device. It's a clock, which stops every time a new message is read. The clock cannot be restarted without this key. Genius. This message was read at 1.34. That would be after the guests had arrived for the party. What did the message say? Well, it doesn't matter. Don't you see what's going on here? It means some foreign agent of unknown allegiance knows of my identity, broke in here, and read this message. This machine, and by extension, the government of Canada, has been compromised. I can't believe a man would do something like that. And to children, no less. Man is defined by nothing, if not his failings. What will we do? Half of those children probably live on the street. They just want to play a game. Well, we find them a new coach. And another seven dollars for uniforms. Uh, well, six, but... Yes, you're right. That's what we'll do. In fact... What are you doing? Articulate your thoughts, man. Just... 
Oof. Mr. Myers, you said this machine was recently outfitted with the clock mechanism? Yesterday. Well, then it's entirely possible that whoever read this message has been reading all of your messages for some time. Yes. Dear God. So this time, the spy saw the clock contraption and knew that the moment you came in here and saw it, he'd be found out. Hmm. He'd have to kill me before I discovered it. What was Waxworthy doing here? Maybe he's the spy. The spy is not one of the guests. The culprit likely came from the outside. How is that possible? I have a secret passageway that allows me to enter and exit the building without being detected. You have a secret passageway that would allow someone from the outside to enter and exit this home undetected, and you did not tell us about it? Yeah. If you'd like to follow me. This whole area is extremely private, and I only enter and exit under the cover of night, so it's very improbable that any friend, family, or neighbor would discover this passageway. What's your theory, then? Well, clearly, this security breach is the result of an extensive surveillance operation conducted by an enemy state. What? Watching your privy? Monitoring the entrance to a top-secret government facility, Inspector. Hidden behind your bookcase. I wonder who could have pulled it off. The resources and ingenuity would be extraordinary. Could be Chernyevsky, the Russians. There's something about this whole thing that reeks of the Germans. Albecher. Or perhaps even Mademoiselle Riviere. Mr. I... Myers, I don't care who did it. The fact that you have hidden this lair and secret passageway from us has rendered the entire investigation to this point useless. You've been lying to us. Maybe you were the one that Waxworthy saw walking through the bookcase. You killed him to protect your secret. And you brought us in here to play out a little charade for the benefit of your wife and children. I admit your theory is quite plausible, but I can assure you I'm far too good of a spy to make that mistake. Have you used this passageway since the murder? No, why? Oh, interesting. Why is that interesting? Because Mr. Waxworthy was a dog. A, a what? Mr. Waxworthy was a dog. And this very red playing card was dropped inside the secret passageway. The spy is a cat. Mr. Myers, one of your own guests, has found you out. can't believe that. It's the only plausible explanation. One of your guests or, or family members is a secret agent. Working against you, and you didn't even know it. Who could it be? I believe this card will lead us to the guilty party. Wait, Murdoch, you can't question anybody about that card. Why not? Whoever dropped it is the killer. And the killer is an espionage agent who must be found and delivered to Prime Minister Laurier. But everyone else out there knows nothing about the passageway, nothing about the spy, and nothing about Terence Myers. And it's imperative that we kept that way. I'm rounding up the cats and dogs. Thank you, Constable. Yeah, uh, enough of this constable business. Call me coach. Oh, All right, lads, let's get down to the gymnasium. We've got a game to play. Yeah! Let's go! Come on! Let's go! Let's coach, are you quite sure this was a good idea? Well, they seem like decent lads. I think it could be fun. I meant the money stolen from the station house. Well, the inspector has enough scotch for now. I'm sure he won't mind missing a few dollars from the kitty. But if he was there, I'd have asked him. Ladies and gentlemen, there has been a development in the case. This card was found in an unusual place. Murdoch. I will not tell you where it was found, but four cats in this room claim to have found two red playing cards each. How you answer the following question will determine the identity of the killer, so please answer carefully. Lorraine, where did you find your two red playing cards? 
Um, I found one in a coat pocket in the cloakroom, and the other was beneath the cushion on that chair. Junior, your two cards? Under a mat at the front door and on a table by the cloakroom. Mr. Anderson, the same question. Behind that painting and on the bottom shelf of the bookcase. Mrs. Billingsley. On the stove in the kitchen and under this lampshade here. Thank you all very much. Our investigation has come to an end. The killer has revealed themselves. This card was the one hidden under that lampshade and later discovered under the dead body of Mr. Waxworthy. Nonsense, that's impossible. Inspector, please arrest Mrs. Billingsley for the murder of Albert Waxworthy. No, it can't be, I, I did Julia, please take the two young Andersons outside to be certain that they're all right. Of course. Please come with me, Mom. I'll call a carriage, Murdoch. Uh, where are you taking her? Station House 4. Best if you come along as well, Mr. Billingsley. Mom? This is ridiculous. That was quite impressive, Murdoch. How did you know that was the exact card found under that lampshade? I didn't. Just a hunch? No. It simply isn't true. Accusing Mrs. Billingsley gave me the opportunity to interrogate the real killer. If any of the four cats were guilty, they would have lied about where they found their playing cards. But all of their accounts matched what Mrs. Anderson told us earlier. So the only person who could have dropped this card The same person who broke into your lair and read your secret message off of your communication device. Dropping this card in her haste to escape. It is true. I am a spy. You tripped the clock on the communication device. You dropped the card on your way out. But how did Waxworthy end up dead? I wanted to go back into the lair to try again to fix it. But he saw me stepping into the privet. Once he knew, he had to be eliminated. You have the authority to murder citizens? I have the authority to do what needs to be done. I distracted him with talk of songbirds, pretended to misidentify one, and suggested he look at the birds of America. There's nothing men like more than proving themselves right. You'd already reset the train. Then took the knife from the kitchen and went back into the lair through the secret passage to lie in wait. Once the bookcase turned, I was ready. I threw the knife into his back. He was dead before he even knew what had happened. Why drag him into the living room where anyone could find him? If Waxworthy simply disappeared, I knew that Lyle would check his office. My only hope was that the police would not find out the truth before I was able to fix everything. Fix what? Eliminate the target. Who are you? What? Who do you work for? When do they get to you? My name is Lara Solnu. I was born in Vienna. I've been an agent of the Austro-Hungarian Empire since I was 14 years old. Oh, dear God. I was sent to Canada to infiltrate your intelligence operations. Great Britain's security was deemed uh, too sophisticated, but Canada, Canada shares in British intelligence. And Canada is weak. I, I compromised the entire British Empire because I was blinded by love. It is true. I was sent here to exploit you. But, but in time, I came to love you. You have been lying to me every day for 18 years. And you to me? It's not the same. How is it not the same? I love you. I love you. 
course you're trying to believe you. What? You shouldn't. And you're sure you've got the right one this time? To be honest, sir, something isn't sitting right. So it was Mrs. Billingsley after all? No, 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 no. It was Myra's wife who breached his lair. But something about her account doesn't add up. She led Waxworthy in, threw her knife in his back, then dragged him out to the middle of the living room to be found. But if that truly was her intent, why not save the time and effort and simply kill him out here? She threw the knife? That's impossible. The knife was buried far too deeply into his back to have been thrown. You're quite sure? Positive. She's lying. What can I, do? I promise you. She led him to the bookcase. Made sure he went inside. Someone else was waiting for him inside the lair. A second spy. She's lying to protect the identity of her accomplice. But who? Mr. Billingsley. I always keep a weapon close at hand. You've killed him. Check his pocket. It's a gun. So Billingsley was her accomplice. She didn't make a single mistake in 18 years. What are the chances she would have exposed herself to Waxworthy? He didn't catch you going into that privet, did he? No, of course not. Hmm. I was the one that was going to find that clock stopped. I was the target. But she sent Waxworthy in. Why? Spare my life. Billingsley was the one lying in wait. And she knew he'd be ready to kill whoever came through that bookcase, assuming it would be me. How did you figure that out? Any spy under deep cover for that long would have a handler, likely someone close to her. Plus, the Billingsleys invited us to Christmas dinner in 1904. Serve soup. Austrians. So he was about to shoot you? No. He was about to shoot her. She had been compromised. And he couldn't let the Canadians find out what she knew. You saved her life just as she saved yours. I love you, Lyle Anderson. My name's Myers. Terrence Myers. If you cooperate, they'll spare your life. Perhaps. Become a double agent. Work with me instead of against me. Would you do the same? Betray the country that you love? Precisely. Goodbye, my love. Goodbye, Terence Myers. Auf Wiedersehen. Sir, uh, I have a confession to make. I helped myself to a loan. Eh? Well, uh, from your kitty. You've stolen from the petty cash? Well, sir, just temporarily. Uh, I've decided to coach a youth basketball team, the Carlton Street Stallions. Uh, but I promise I'll have them raise the funds and, and pay it all back. What's the money for? Uniforms. I'll tell you what, Krupsi. You can keep the money on one condition, that they change their name. Sir? Station 4 Stallions. Oh, I like the ring of that. Managed by Coach Crabtree. Oh, I love the ring of that. <laughs> Make sure I get an invite to the first game. Sir, will do. Thank you, my good fellow. 
<laughs> Seems we can't manage to avoid one another. It does seem that way, Detective. Perhaps it is a sign from above. I can't say I'm a believer in such things. No, nor am I. Then again, I have nothing to do for the remainder of the afternoon. Would you care for a pretzel, Mr. Strange? Yes, I think I would. One. Will you see your wife again? Doubtful. Although our man McCutcheon was captured in Salzburg, he survives the torture, there could be a trade. That would be nice. Thank you, Murdoch. You're welcome, Mr. Myers. The name's Anderson. Well. Dad, what happened? Children, I'm afraid I have some very bad news to give you. Your mother has run off with Mr. Billingsley. What? What? Yeah. It was the two of them that killed Mr. Waxworthy in order to try to keep their clandestine love affair from getting out, and... Our men are pursuing them now. Hmm. I fear they may be headed for the border. Hmm. In which case, we'll likely never see either of them again. We'll never see Mom again. No, son. I'm sorry. So we're stuck with you? <laughs> Dad, Bud and I have an announcement. We're getting married. Father? Hmm. Uh -huh. Sorry. So, when is your new book coming out? <laughs> I beg your pardon? 50 Reasons to Kill Your Husband by Dr. Julia Ogden. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, you clearly have been giving it a great deal of thought. Even if you were a dastardly Russian spy, I wouldn't kill you, really. Although you could stand to be more complimentary of my cooking. Talk about motive for murder. I'm the fruit, call me Monkey Luffy. I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy. I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy. And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so spooky. Faves. Faves. Call me Monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves and don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly Stretch it out, come the fruit, call me Monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves and don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly Don't make me go gear four Because I might start a riot, maybe even start a war I'ma use my bare fist, I don't even need a sword I already got a source, man, you know, so off in a roar If you fuck with my crew, my anger's been a sore I'm called the fifth ever for a reason I'm as crazy as a boar, I'ma hit you with this one piece as I goof off and explore I might get myself in trouble but I always get the score yeah. Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves and don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves and don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly I was hitting on your book, I was on back to the bone Doing my comments on trouble like an Amazon You made me mad at boy, and I cut you near the stone So if you meet me in person, you better watch your tone We got a be on come one day, we did it all alone There is no instance of bugs, it's like you saw the dog and at the end of the day, this I will not die alone Because I am a father, I will sing for my own Pussy boy, get out of my way You don't want to waste me, I love you, stick to my veins Well, I've been in this fool, I will send you lots of space So you throw your horse power, do you want to fucking taste? And I'm not a shit doctor, but I'll put you in your place If you want the one too, I will send you off the way And I'm not in the jokes, so these kids will not be played Bitches be crazy, that's what I'm gonna say Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy